Hello, 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 my dear sweet bollockers. It is your friendly neighbourhood loudmouth. It's Howard H. Smith. It's time for some talking bollocks! Yes, indeed, it's talking bollocks time. Once again, it's time to get some bollocks in your ear. It's time for me to talk bollocks. So, um, as is always, let's get on with the intro. My name is Howard H. Smith. I do stand-up comedy. I do this podcast. I do Acid Rain. I do lots of stuff. You can find me, Acid Rain, that's rain spelt R-E-I-G-N, on all social media and at acidrain.co.uk. Does anybody bother with websites anymore? And you can find me doing comedy, comedy, doing Keith Platt, which sounds a bit strange, but it's true. Um, Keith Platt, professional Yorkshireman at keithplatt.co.uk. Does anybody do websites anymore? Or all social media. And you can also find the wonderful Talking Bollocks podcast. Hello, 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 hello. Yes, downloaded to your podcast player every month if you have subscribed. But that leads straight into some announcements. And there's going to be a few of these. So this is a quite different way I'm going to be approaching, well, this episode in particular. Um, It's going to be a a long while before I get to the what's been going on in the middle of this month, because there's a lot to get through um, to do with the podcast, to do with um, me, to do with all sorts of bits and pieces to do with what's been going on anyway. So... Um, First up, an announcement. There will not... I'm going back, I'm afraid, there will not be... Well, it's good news, bad news. Good news... Sorry, bad news is there will not be a song on the end of the podcast anymore. Um, Turns out, (laughs) I was thinking that YouTube was the issue. No, actually, you're not allowed to use music on podcasts unless you get copyright clearance. What a fucking idiot I am. Yes, that's right. We had that issue pointed out uh, to us. So I'm afraid, no, cannot be playing music on the podcast. However, however, hold on to your hats there. I don't know where that came Hold on to your hats. Where did that come from? Years ago when people used to wear hats, Howard, you fucking idiot. Oh yeah, of course. Right. So, um, people still do wear hats, but you know what I mean? You know, when they used to throw the hats in the air to celebrate something, you know, <laughs> hat in the air. Ta-ra! Um, congratulations to you, sir, on your fine horse. Um, so anyway, the good news is, Bollocks Radio is a thing. That's right. Once a month, there is going to be a Bollocks Radio show, and it's not going to be coming to your cod cod past. (laughs) It's not going to be coming to your cod past player. It's not going to be coming to your podcast player. Wow, I actually managed to take a word and turn it round, not just a couple of words and stick the wrong letters on the front. Anyway... Bollocks Radio is a thing. It's the first episode is available already, but you have to go to the Talking Bollocks YouTube channel. And YouTube is the only place you will be able to hear the Bollocks Radio show. You will not be able to hear it on your podcast players due to copyright issues. But I can do it. Um, Difference is... Um, podcasts can be are usually downloaded and um, therefore it's a completely different issue to YouTube, which is streaming. So basically, Bollocks Radio will be happening once a month on YouTube. Go to the Talking Bollocks um, uh, uh, page now. It is youtube.com forward slash Talking Bollocks with a Z on the end, not an S. And subscribe. And every time a new episode goes up, you'll get a notification. Get the YouTube app on your phone. Um, you know, whatever you want to do. But that's the only place you'll be able to listen to it. For those of you who have YouTube Premium or YouTube Red, you'll be able to download it from YouTube, um, So, which is a bit weird. Or you might you might not be able to. I don't know. I haven't got that fucking app. I haven't got YouTube Red Pro, fucking whatever it is. So, you, the you, Talking Bollocks YouTube channel is where you'll hear Bollocks Radio every month. There's the first episode up. There's the first episode up now. If you didn't know that, that's because you didn't don't follow any of the Talking Bollocks social media. If you did, you'd know all of that already. So it's because we posted about it. It's been up there for over a week. So go to Talking Bollocks YouTube channel. Check out Bollocks Radio. Also, also. Lo and behold, it is actually happening. And now, an official announcement. So, this is the uh, official announcement. I am here with uh, my good buddy, uh, Godless. Say hello, Godless. Hey, so happy to be with you. So happy to be with you, Dark Box. Oh, marvelous! You could just so anyway. We've uh, we've got an announcement to make. Some of you may have already uh, already seen this. But um, uh, Godless and I are going to be doing a live podcast 
um, in London. And um, uh, because I'm psychic, something tells me that Godless has got all the details to hand. So over to you. (laughs) (laughs) Over to you, buddy. Yeah, 18th of January. That's a Friday night, am I right? At 9 p.m. at the Etcetera Theatre in, uh, was that Camden Road, something like that? There in London, Borough of Camden. It's right, uh, right in the middle of Camden. Uh, you can buy the tickets uh, at uh, ticketea.co.uk. They're going quickly. you got to get on this. Yes, absolutely. Or just go to etcetratheatre.com um, and you'll be able to find uh, our show on the 18th of January, £6.50. Um, it's, it's a great venue. Um, it will surely be a good night. Um, Godless and I are going to have loads of great stuff lined up for you um, and I'm going to complete, be completely honest with you as I always am we haven't got a fucking clue what we're going to be doing at this <laughs> <laughs> at, at this moment in time it's funny how I've been like going to the gym just to get ready just in case you know, I, I don't know what that means I don't know if that like is like I'm, I'm afraid that my clothes might fall off or something but like it's like god damn it I can't show up for that so this is this is good timing for like you know trying to get rid of my uh, my gut, you know. Well, like, well, you've got. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, a you've got the perfect um, uh, you've got the perfect inspiration in Chuck, um, and B um, <laughs> yeah. I, I have this yeah. vis- I have this vision of there being a table and two chairs and us sat round that table discussing shit. Um, but but also having a roving mic in the audience that people can cast that pass round. And, and ask quest- and ask questions as well, um, and obviously oh and obviously there's going to be there is going to be sort of major topics up for discussion. Um, Just nobody, nobody trying to hit me with trivia. I got to prep for everything. I, you don't realize I I bullshit almost everything I say. So it's like I got to spend a few hours like prepping on anything I'm going to talk about, or else I look incredibly stupid, which I'm already afraid of doing. But seeing as this is an in person appearance, I'm not so sure I've done something quite similar before you know you really i'll tell you what mate you're really selling this (laughs) (laughs) guys i'm gonna be shit make sure you come along (laughs) well you know this is the thing if i either throw up or shit myself like this will be the one and only time i do it so you better be there you know oh god yeah you've got a nasty habit of shitting yourself once a year and i think you're gonna (laughs) get i think i think 2019s is gonna be very early in the year (laughs) Yes, I'll be honest with you. It would almost be worth it just to get it out of the way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I look, I'm, we'll be discussing topics and, and getting into it as always. I'm going to be improvising as much as possible to render Godless's script completely and totally irrelevant. <laughs> um, d- dra- to use a boxing term, drag him, drag you into deep waters. Um, but um, it's look, it's it's going to be fun. Come along if you if you're a listener of the podcast. This is uh, this is at the moment a once in a lifetime opportunity. I certainly can't uh, uh, see see many of these happening. So um, do get along wherever you are in the country. January the eighteenth. It's a Saturday. Godless said nine. The show starts at nine. Doors are eight thirty. So get down there. Um, we'll show you to your to your seats personally. Um, anything to add, mate? I was just going to add that I'm coming to town because I'm, I'm doing a pilgrimage to go see one of the greatest bands in the world, Architects, are performing the, night, the next night at Wembley Arena. So if you're making that journey as well, you're pilgrimaging from elsewhere in the UK or Ireland like I am, make this part of the weekend, you know? Just plan on coming in on Friday and, uh, and joining us on Friday night before going to the show on Saturday. I reckon the only person who listens to this podcast who likes the Architects is you. And you're already, <laughs> and you're already coming. Uh, that's so not true. <laughs> oh come on! I, you you could just uh, this live podcast is going to be a blast because it's going to be it's going to be lots of stuff like you making statements like you know how brilliant the architects are, and then everybody <laughs> in the room groaning. Oh, um, uh, no, see, everybody in the audience is going to be laughing at you because they'd be like, who are the architects? Oh, no, I, yeah, I'm the architect. I know, I call, I, call the, I call the descendants the descendants, but it's descendants. And everyone knows, yeah. who, ar- everyone knows who architects are. They're the shit version of the previous band called, the ar- called Architects. I've never heard of them. Oh, man. <laughs> they, they, are, they are the architects you need to be checking out, dude. 
Uh, yeah, because they were probably born in the 18th century. That's every band that you're into. I get it. I get it. I, I, dude, I, I like youngsters and their instruments as much as, much as I like old men and their instruments. Um, as long as you know, as long as there's something in there that uh, that appeals to me, then I am more than happy to go along with it. But you know, mm. just some of the bands that you go on about, like Zealand, uh, um, uh, Deaf Heaven, stuff like that, I, I literally find myself listening to it just, just absolutely, completely, and consumed with one emotion, which is why. It, it's just. <laughs> I, I, I just, Why is that an emotion? Why? It, oh, believe you and me, it, it, it is. It is in my head. It is in my head. 18th of January, we're going to settle all this. Yeah, it's right. Hook of my crook. Okay, we're all going to be settled. Okay, make sure you're there, folks. Please come and join us. <laughs> and there you have it, folks. Yes, it's actually happening. So you heard all the details there. Please do get your asses over to um, the website and you can go to etcetratheatre.com or the uh, the website that um, Godless mentioned there. Uh, check out um, the Talking Bollocks social medias and Godless's social medias. If you follow those, you'll see you'll see links available um, and come on down. Now, I, I cannot emphasize this enough because there has been a small amount of confusion. It is a um, podcast, live podcast recording. It is not a broadcast. You will not be able to listen live. And if you want to come along and answer a load of que- and throw a load of questions at us um, and make us look stupid, feel free. But you have to be at the gig. You have to be there. So uh, it promises to be a really, really good laugh. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Godless and I are going to do actually do well. I am actually going to do some uh, some preparation for once in my life. But the two of us are really looking forward to uh, to fielding questions from you all um, and you know talking about absolutely anything that you want to talk about. We will um, probably have some major topics that we want to discuss uh, first, but it will mainly be you guys. Well, a good part of it will be you guys chucking questions at us because we always set the agenda. You know, when it, uh, um, if, if if we're doing a podcast. Um, you're always listening to us talking about what we want to talk about. Why not get us out of our comfort zone and and, and get us to talk about stuff that well, not that we don't want to talk about, but you know that we haven't talked about before or whatever. So it, it'd be a re- it, it's going to be a really really good night. Um, it would be great to see you all down there. So do your best. Um, get your accommodation booked. Get down to London and um, the Etc. Theatre. So, wow, just just 13 minutes in and you've had, you're getting a new monthly Bollocks radio show, only available on YouTube, and you're getting a live podcast recording. This fucking, this fucking Bollocast is gaining some momentum, motherfucker. It's really starting to rock and roll. So, um, you know, and that's all thanks to you guys. That is all thanks to you guys. And, again, a nice little segue into my show um, in Leeds earlier in the month, um, right at the beginning of the month, actually. It seems like fucking years ago now, and it was only three weeks ago. Um, So three weeks ago, I did my um, spoken word show, the Tales from the Book of Thrash in Leeds. Thank you very much to all of you who came to that. Thanks to the bollockers who came. Thanks to the Acid Rain fans. And thanks to the people who um, didn't know what it was. And, um, well, no, there wasn't anybody there who didn't know what it was. Everybody knew what it was. And thanks once again to everybody at Crash Records. That was fucking awesome that they, that they booked it and pushed it. Um, and um, it was a, how would I describe it, um, a intimate, an intimate show. Um, yeah, that's brackets for not many people there. Um, but those that did come had a great time, including myself. It was really good fun, really enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can't thank you enough for just coming out and, and listening to me go on and on about stuff that I used to do um, stupidly when I was a kid on tour. Um, but I, I really do appreciate it, though. I really, really do appreciate it. So thank you very much. So, yeah. What has been going on in the world of metal since we last spoke? Well, um, it's the big one. 
Now, I am going to put... A, a, the big one is Slayer's last ever show, or at least my last ever Slayer show. Um, and yes, they've since been announced for download, and no, I'm not going. Um, look, I love playing festivals, and I like festival as a concept. But for me, um, standing in a field and listening to... Usually listening to the wind take about half the sound... <laughs> Um, I don't know, there's something, I, I find it very difficult to connect with bands at festivals. I am, I, the smaller the venue, the better for me. Um, and the way, and so, I, I'm, anyway, the way Slayer made Wembley Arena feel, they made it feel like a club. Um, it was absolutely superb, it really was. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about it, but there is going to be, I recorded basically about two days after the gig... I sat down with my with my mic and my laptop and I recorded exactly how I was feeling because having seen Slayer, which I figured this out, I'm now 48. Um, I first saw Slayer when I was 17. I've seen them once every two years since I was 17. So seeing them for the last time was a pretty big deal. And um, I wanted to really capture how I was feeling because it was... It was quite a unique feeling. So I did that. I sat down and I recorded it. And I'm going to put that on the end of the podcast. So, you know, kind of like a kind of like a, a, a song at the end of the podcast, but not much. Um, not much like a song, that is. Um, and and I, I really kind of talk about my, uh, my, my feelings. And I wanted to capture it now. And I'm glad I did because I wouldn't be able to kind of summon up exactly where, you know, the place that I was in um, now. But one thing, I think a few things that I may have not mentioned is um, uh, they played Payback, which was fucking awesome. That is one of my, that is that is an all-time favourite Slayer song for me. It's on God Hates Us All. It's a killer, killer track. Um, I mean, for any of you who don't like God Hates Us All, just, just play, just play Payback. Bloody hell, try to say that after a few beers. Just play Payback. Play payback, play payback, play payback. Oh, it's actually quite easy. Um, but um, uh, uh, the the only bit of the whole night, to, uh, Tom Mariah fucked up. Um, it, I mean, it's not surprising because the lyrics are just fucking insanely quick. But um, what was cool was the reaction is he just laughed. But um, uh, it was awesome nonetheless. Um uh, things that uh, and the Slayer merch, as always, w- looked like a five-year-old had gone mad with crayons on black T-shirts. Um, I mean, Slayer, one of the most consistent live bands I'll ever see, and their merch also consistent, consistently shit. Don't think I've ever bought a Slayer. In fact, I think the only piece of Slayer merch I ever bought was when I very first saw them on the Rain and Blood tour, which was that that um, th- it was a sweatshirt. With that huge, big white face, with and it's and it's like a demon face with Slayer, the Slayer emblem in, in the middle of its forehead. I don't know if any of you remember that. I think that's the only thing I ever bought, and I think I bought it because it was like I was seeing Slayer for the first time. I, I, I mean, they're legendary, legendary shit merch, um, and a bit and, and a bit pricey as well, to be honest. Um, Anthrax had some cool merch, which I knew they would do, um, but um, but there you go. Um, but the the Slayer set list was fucking amazing. I think something else I left out at the end, uh, the two things I left out were they played Black Magic from Show No Mercy. That is the song that got me into Slayer. That's the first first song that I remember going, oh, wow, that's cool. Um, and And to hear it live at the last time I was ever going to see them was at the time, it wasn't like after, at the time I was like, fucking hell. I had so much going on in my head at the time. So many feelings kind of like, you know, rising and falling as as um, uh, as I went through their set. And as, as it was coming towards the end of the set, it was, I couldn't help but count down the songs and think, right, you know, that's the last time I'm going to see that. Last time. And, oh, you know, and, and it, was, it was, yeah, it was just almost too much to bear, I have to say. But then... Um, when the Hanuman backdrop came down at Angel of Death, that was just class as fuck. It's just so fucking classy. Just an awesome, awesome, awesome touch. It really was. It was just so fucking cool. Um, it, it, anyway, I'm, I'm going to talk about this at the end of the show, but I just wanted to say that um, I, I mentioned a few things that I know I forgot to mention um in the piece that you're going to hear um afterwards two things that um were not great about the show of course they'd be audience based wouldn't they that's right one and uh, look 
this this I was uh, I'm not a smoking Nazi right but boy was the smoking ban fucking called off there was a ceasefire in the smoking war um uh at Slayer people were just sparking up all over the place no one gave a shit I mean ultimately I guess that's you know that's a Slayer crowd and a sign of the Slayer crowd um which was um which was fucking amazing and yes, it was their last ever gig. And yes, it was an arena show. But people, put your fucking phones away, you cunts! Especially for short asses like me. I, it's, it's bad enough there's the back of your fucking head. But even worse is when you're trying to see past people and you can see past... And all you can see, it, literally, it's like watching... You know, they haven't got screens at the gig. No, but there's a load of screens around me. People's fucking phones... Jesus fucking Christ, I went to see Therapy a couple of nights ago with Jace Lewis, which was awesome, by the way. It was Neil from The Beyond. Um, he was in town with the Therapy, obviously, so off we went. But anyway, um, hardly a phone. Hardly a phone could be seen filming anything all night. By the way, they did a fucking uh, Slayer tribute, played a little bit of Rain in Blood, which was fucking amazing. Um, but <laughs> Sidebar. But fucking hell. If you were at Wembley, Wembley Arena and you were phoning it, you're a fucking twat. Um, having said that, you know, I've just realised. Do you know what I did first thing the following day? First, first thing I did the following day was go on YouTube and try and find clips of that night show. What a contradictory cunt I really am. Hey, what a twat. Uh, that, um, that seems like the perfect moment to go to the first interview. First interview is with J.S. Clayden of Pit Shifter. They will have already played London by now. They will have probably already played your town. Um, Loved Pitch Shifter back in the day. Um, Pitchshifter.com was a was a fucking amazing album. If any of you uh, are unaware of it, go and check it out. It is it's it's industrial metal. It's it's very fucking cool. It's a great album. Um, big fan, big fan, right here. Unfortunately, in the interview, I did mention I was going to go down and see them. Unfortunately, um, well. Oh, or fortunately, depends how it comes up, but I ended up getting a comedy gig, so I wasn't able to go. Um, so my apologies to to, uh, to John for that. Um, but you are now going to hear um, our interview. Uh, our interview? What the fuck? Well, it's our chat. That's right. Our chat. This is me and John chatting just a couple of weeks ago. Howard. <laughs> Hello there. How are you? Good. I can't complain. They don't let me complain. Uh, yeah, yeah. How did you? How did you end up? Um, how did you end up um, relocating to where you are now? Then um, I got bored of the cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking freezing. Don't rub it in. It's going to be seventy-eight degrees Fahrenheit here today. Ah, oh, you swine! All right. So uh, yeah, but well, still, I shall sample. I shall resample the joys of the English cold soon enough. Yes, yes, you will be. Um, <laughs> and, and, so there's there's been all sorts of off and on things over the year. Um, any particular reason why now? Is it just finally all clicked into place and everyone's schedules said, yeah, we can make it happen? <sighs> I mean, we get offers all the time, <clears throat> right? People will contact and say, "Oh, do you want to headline the?" Orc Slayer Festival in Malmo in Sweden for, you know, X much money and 20 boxes of cigarettes and a live goat. Yes. And we always be like, yeah, you know, they never really felt right. <clears throat> we kind of stay in touch with each other. And it kind of, there was like an organic groundswell around it being 20 years of the dot-com record. And then, you know, the band was chattering about it. Obviously, the band's two sets of brothers, Dan and Tim on guitar are brothers, and Mark and I are brothers, so we all kind of keep in contact. And we obviously, as brothers, we fight with each other, and it just kind of kept going. And then DHP, uh, Pitch Sisters' kind of home was Rock City in Nottingham for a very long time, right? Yeah. And DHP, who own Rock City, have kind of super blossomed since that time into kind of a national promoter and festivals and events and venues and all kinds of stuff. But we actually have still remained tight with the owners from the early days when they were just kind of doing gigs at Rock City. And so they, you know, approached us and said, 
seems like there's chatter about this. Do you want to do a show? And I foolishly said yes <laughs> to one gig. I said, yeah, let's do one crazy, you know, Sons of Nottingham return, one night out in Nottingham, and let's get Earth to Niner from Nottingham and the blueprint to reform, and let's just do one crazy, you know, like a nutter's ball Christmas bash thing, one-off night. We won't make any money. I'll spunk it all on the flights for a one-off show, but we'll just come back and have a laugh, and I'll, I'll bring the family, and, you know, we'll just make it a fun thing. Yeah. So that quickly spiraled into six back-to-back shows all over the bloody country, of course. <laughs> of course. When you did... When you disappear, when you disappear for a decade, and you come back, it was like, "Well, I want a bit of that." So we could have kept going, but we just did what we thought we could do. You know, six shows at my age, young man. <laughs> uh, back-to-back shows is is kind of brutal after jumping off the merry-go-round for a decade. You know, yeah, that that is pretty brutal. Six back-to-back. I mean, but the thing is, yeah. I, I can see the logic there. That the minute you say yes to one gig. People will people will instantly start the well you know all that effort for one gig it's just as you know it's it's not exactly. it's not much more difficult to do another three or four exactly yeah so you know I will see what it is but I, I, I remember reading an article in my glorious thirties which have long since passed by the way I remember reading an article from the cult. <clears throat> And I randomly bump into members of the cult out in L.A. You know, you see them go around, kind of moving loosely, some in similar circles, but they're all billionaire, you know. And uh, I read an article by the, with the cult, and they're like, oh, you know, we're just... I remember what the tagline was, we're, we're in our 40s, we're missing teeth, and we just want to connect with people. And I read it, and I was like, ha, ha, ha. You know, how ridiculous. But then you get pushing 50, as I am, and someone says, oh, you want to do some shows and, you know, your brother and your friends in the band is like, let's just do it for the crack. And then you think, well, why are we doing it? Is it for the money? No. It will, I will not retire to Acapulco from six shows schlepping around England in the cold. Yeah. Is it for the fame? No. You know, we've already done the covers of magazines and we were much more important, well, in our own lunchtime back in the day. So, what is it? Is it for? Well, it's for the crack because we love it, but it's also, I guess, to connect with people. So I think, you know, looking back, I think the cult actually got it right. You get to this kind of reflective period in your life when you're a bit older, and you look at, you forget what you've done. You know, you you go to Cub Scout meetings with your kids, and you're taking out the trash, and you're going to footy games, and all that stuff, and then you you forget, and you look back and go, oh yeah, we made six studio albums, and we toured in thirty countries, and we were in copy of 2000 AD once and 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 all this stuff you did and you think yeah we really connected with people and we had a lot of laughs so let's let's do it before we're too old I mean I can't imagine another 10 years from now offers will be around so (laughs) 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 probably best to do it now lad Well, I, well, I, 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 I've got a similar experience. I mean, uh, you know, Acid Rain came back in 2015. Well, I say Acid Rain, it's just me, but, you know, therein lies the, right. you know, therein lies the, it was somebody else's idea to reformed. And we we, fought, we reformed, and then one by one, they all left before we'd even done a gig. Um, oh. be, because it's not easy trying to, trying to fit stuff like this, you know, back into your life when you, you've got major commitments elsewhere. Um, but yeah, I, know... I mean, we've all we all grew up, right? So we've all got yeah, fam- families, multiple kids, responsibilities, and then with the time zone, obviously England's eight hours ahead of me, so I'm quite up and up till midnight trying to sort out business to make sure that it's a positive experience for fans. So I'm up and up at midnight, and then up at six to uh, you know stay up till midnight to do business, and then up at six to, to get work done. So it's like run up to the top <laughs> pretty brutal to be honest <laughs> yeah yeah it sounds like it well I, 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 unlike yourself I, I'm I, I've I've gone down the route of no kids no wife <laughs> no, uh, so uh, and uh, very few responsibilities but um, uh, I know exactly what you mean about the about the reconnecting and like why are you doing it and and you and you will for want of a better phrase you will feel the love 
you know, and there'll be there'll be loads of people with all who've all got their own little pitch shifter story that you, you know that you're completely unaware right. of and stuff like that. And it'll be a blast, man. It really, really will because I think the reason we did it, what I found when we first came back on our first tour was it was that the band and the fans were both having the same experience, basically. You know, it was just... Right, and, that, you know, and that's kind of always been pitch shifter's thing. We've always said the stage just happens to be a few feet higher than the rest of the venue. We're all exactly. in together. Exactly. super special about any of us. Exactly. Like, you can't have a gig. You can't have a gig unless everybody's in it. Otherwise, you're just playing through an empty room. All that aloof rock star nonsense. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we got... We got posthumously labelled as Rocktronica and Crossover and all of this stuff, but I always saw us as a punk band. Yeah. Right? We had our, we had our own political beliefs, and we were very much inspired by rudimentary P9 and Crass and the Dead Kennedys, and that was kind of what we grew up listening to. And then on Peel, R.I.P., he introduced us to loads of different music, and we got into the heavier stuff and also the dance stuff and the drum and bass and everything. But at the end of the day, we're still a... We just see ourselves as a punk band, right? Where music is about communicating our ideas and whether they resonate with people. I know that sounds very arty and lofty, but that's, you know, if you're not going down the money path of doing loads of puke-making ballads for the money, then you really are about exchanging ideas, right? That's what your music's communicating. Whether your idea is just bonkersness like Frank Zappa or more politically focused like ours has been. You really are about connecting and communicating. So we'll see. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I've still got most of my own teeth and hair. <laughs> and uh, I look kind of the same, but I've got no idea whether it's going to be everyone that came to see us back in the day or whether there'll be any new people there, or whether everybody's weathered the storm like we have. I mean, we've weathered divorce, <clears throat> cancer, life-threatening car crashes. I mean, we've been through the ring and we're all still kicking. And, and that's the main thing. I mean, the fact that you're all, you know, like you say, you, that you're all still around and able to, to do this one last time is, um, it, it'd be a shame not to. Yeah. And, you know, and it's a bummer that Jason can't join us. Our drummer, Jace, he's a fancy pants playing with uh, giant bands now, so he couldn't come, so that's the one kind of bittersweet part of it but then uh, Cy Hutchby who's the drummer for Earth 09 is like I'll do them both if you want <laughs> so I'm like alright you nut job you're going to do two sets back to back but he's a young sprightly lad of maybe 30s he's into yoga and treating his body well so he'll be fine well hey look and, and if, if that's if, he's, if the offer's there then that's, that's worked out pretty, pretty sweetly for you guys yeah and I think you know, going back to why you're doing it, I think I think it's a, like a, a rose-colored period for us, right? So when you, you know, you've been in the music biz, when you're starting out, you just suck different shades of shit through a thicker or shorter straw for a long period of time. Oh, do this show for free. It'll be great for your career. Oh, take this up the bum for 10 bucks because it'll be great for your career. And then we're not promoting any album. We're not hoping to get land a big record deal and we're not hoping to do this or that so this tour really is just about playing the shows which has been super liberating people call up and say you know it's fancy pants magazine and we'd like to come and review it, do a review of the show and we're going to need eight passes and five photographer passes and blah 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 and we're, who looks after our stuff says do you want to do this and i'm like no just email them back and say declined period thank you period yeah because we don't have to like we don't have to suck that shit through a straw. Excuse my French, because it's just about the show and the ticket sales are already sold. So you you can't dangle the carrot in front of us like, oh, this would be great for your career. I don't care if you want to come to the show and say, oh, pitch shift a bunch of old has bins out of their prime. You're gonna have to pay twenty quid for the flag. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been super liberating. My yeah. brother Mike, can you do that? I'm like, yeah, we can do that. I'm doing it now. That's it's that. Blind. That great. is Thank awesome. You. Yeah, that 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 is awesome. So it's... anyone anyone that anyone that contacted us before the show and said we'd like to run an article about you, any one of those people have said, "Oh, and can we come to the show?" I said, "Sure, you're on the guest list. Let's do it." Yeah. Anyone who's called me at the end and said, "Oh, you know, we're a big fans of Pants Magazine, and you need us, and we're going to do a show review," I just said, "No, thanks." 
they're like, well, but but then you know, the people won't know about the shows. Like the people that need to know about the shows already know because they've already bought a ticket, and they won't care whether it's been reviewed or not because they'll have been there. Yeah. So that's been melting a few. That's been melting a few people's minds because they're like, you can't do that. Just did it. Well, Suck the, it up. Well, the, up. well, the thing is, as well, is that basically there's no agenda, is there? There's, you know, there's no agenda outside those six shows. They just, they, they, you know, they, they exist in, in in their own space in time, and that's it. That's the only, that's the only product, if you like, is the six shows. Exactly, and um, you know, we haven't done any merchandise for a decade. We're not upkeeping the website. There's no carrot to dangle. But people say, oh well, you know, your merch sales are going to suffer. It's like what merch sales? We printed enough merch for the tour. It'll probably sell out before we even get to the end of the tour, <laughs> and that'll be it. And then we'll return to Cun Lun in, in our cryo chamber obscurity <laughs> and people will wonder what happened. <laughs> um, uh, and you've sold, out, uh, you've sold out London. You've had an extra date, haven't you? Yeah, we, we sold out the first London show. So it, that all kind of ties in as well. So Mark and I were born at home in Highbury. So our mum said she went to the hospital in the early 70s, she said, I didn't like the look of that, so I decided to just have you both at home with the midwife. So Mark and I are very much from Highbury in North London. Yeah. The garage is High- Highbury Corner. Yeah. It's one of the first shows we ever played in London, and then DHP now own it. Wow. That's a lovely... Who's the close friend of the band. So. Yeah. And I found online, like 19 years ago, we played there with Earth Tone 9, because I found all the pictures in the, an obscure hard drive that I had in deep in the vault. So it's like this weird kiss met alignment at the stars of us playing Ivory. So we did that. You know, they said, oh, do you want to do these side venues? I said, that's probably best if we do smaller venues. I have no idea who still remembers how relevant we are, you know, in our old age. So let's do smaller venues. So we picked some smaller venues and then obviously Manchester's sold out. Uh, first night in London sold out. So they said, do you want to add the second night? We're like, sure. So we added a second night in London, and that's doing pretty good. Nottingham's doing pretty good. I mean, ticket sales have been pretty robust. But no one can complain about ticket sales for a band that's not done a damn thing for a decade. Selling out a couple of venues and having really... Ro- the Nottingham show is going to be nuts. It's going to be nuts. Ticket sales are great. It's the last show of the tour. Earth Tone 9 are playing, you know, another Nottingham band. The Blueprint is a Nottingham band have reformed for the show I just think it's going to be bonkers it's, it's, <laughs> Gurgy loins it's, it's everything it's everything you could have wanted isn't it you know sold out shows bands reforming to play with you uh, I mean that, it's like I say it's just it's I mean surely this would have, this would have been like the ultimate outcome you know when you were when you were first thinking of doing this wouldn't it be great if some souls sh- you know so shows sold out and you know we could get we could get some bands back together and play with us I mean it's 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 all coming together for you. Yeah, I couldn't, you know, in Pit, <laughs> Pit Sister have had this, we've played for a very long time, right? We've played in 30 countries over 20 plus years. So I've literally played a massive venue to three people, <laughs> one of which was a dog that was asleep. <laughs> and then we've played to 65,000 people supporting Black Sabbath. You know, we played with Metallica in Madrid. So you have all these bonkers experiences all the way through. And we've always said to ourselves, if the gig's empty, it's a practice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, yeah. It's a, it's a public <laughs> so practice. You'll, you'll often see that you'll find some old video of us playing and there's hardly anybody there and we're all laughing around and having a great time and you know, people say, well, why aren't you upset? Right, because it, we still get to play. It's like if our buddy at a wedding said, oh, the gear's all up there. Do you want to jump up and do a set? We're like, yeah, why not? So for us, they're just, the crap gigs are just sad. Ah, it's practice for the next one. So we've always had a real laugh. But yeah, you, no one can complain. We don't really do complaining. Well, I think there's, I think there's two things behind that. There's firstly, if the gigs, you know, like you said, the crap gigs. Firstly, you're there anyway. So what are you going to do? And secondly, exactly. however few people are there, it's not their fucking fault that nobody else showed up. Exactly. Exactly. And they, so know. we always just, you know, we, you'll see us always having a laugh and being punk, and we never take it very seriously. We're kind of like. Pink Floyd slash Monty Python, personally <laughs> as individuals, you know, whenever you'll you'll often hear if something's not going right at Sanchez or whatever, you'll often hear someone say, "Do you people have any concept of who I think I used to be?" <laughs> <laughs> and 
and you see the house crew it takes them a while to figure out and they're like wait a minute they're making fun of themselves yes we do that so I mean we've played with some bands who take themselves way too freaking seriously to the point where I just can't I just can't handle it I just start laughing we've played with bands where the you know where you have the big pre-production meet when you're the sport band and they come and say okay anything with orange tape on it is a vanity riser so as the support bands, you're not allowed to stand on that area of the stage. You're confined to the middle of the stage. And we're only going to give you 90 dB on the desk and all this stuff. And we'll sit and nod and yeah, yeah, yeah. And the very first song, I'll look at our salmon and he gives me the thumbs up and he spanks it all the way up to 120 dB. And then we immediately all run on the orange taped area that we're not supposed to be on. And you can see the main, I think we did that to Limp Biscuit or Stain and their tour manager was going crazy. Like, <laughs> we just kept going because... It doesn't matter. <laughs> We're all in the same space. Like, you being 10 dB louder than me and being able to move around the stage more won't make you any better than me or people like you more. Just yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's, such, <laughs> it's such a lame idea as well, isn't it? It's such a lame idea that you're, you've, got to, you've got to protect your product by, by you know, yeah. sabotaging other people on the bill. And it's like, you know, people aren't going to go away and go, well, Pitch Shifter all right, but they were a bit quiet, weren't they? And hence, I really liked Limp yeah. Biscuit. you know. Yes, my, my DB meter suggests that pitch shifter are 5 dB quieter, ergo 5% less good. You know? Yeah. So we don't do any of that. And that's one of the great things of this tour is so 9 is, you know, long-time friends of the band. Uh, Blueprint, long-time friends of the band. So we all know each other. It's all going to be fine. We actually did a competition and gave away all of the first on support slots from Nottingham to just random acts that applied. So... That's our little thank you back, paying it forward if we can. We're not looking for anything out of it. You know, we could have done the corporate suckling on the teeth of the demonic corporate chimera and said, yeah, it's a grand you've got to pay on, you know, and made a bit of extra pocket money. But Mark and I are like, yeah, we don't want to do that. Let's just give, you know, give someone a free crack at it. You know, run a competition, listen to the bands, the ones that sound good and win, chuck them on. So there's, a, there's like five first on supports that I've personally never heard of before that, that applied for a competition and they're on, so they get a crack at it. So that, that kind of stuff makes me feel good too. Yeah. That, that, and that's, it's a really nice touch and it's, and it's a, um, it, it's, it's within the, um, the kind of the character of the band, you know, it's, I mean, I, I remember going, I remember seeing you guys on the uh, pitch shifter.com tour. Um, and I would say, I mean, I live in London and I saw you, saw you in London um, me and a mate went and we we just said the whole experience was you know we had a great album the ticket prices were were reasonable they were no you know they were noticeably a few quid less than other bands of a similar stature at the time uh, your merch right. was really cool and was reasonably priced and we and I remember we were both we were like driving home afterwards and we we're talking about how the whole the whole experience from buying the album to seeing the band uh, to buying the ticket to seeing the band to buying the shirt the whole thing was what felt like a really um uh just a great experience but also something that was coming from the band as opposed to quite clearly a um a managed experience yeah we've always tried to do that like i say you you're not going to get rich from doing six shows in England so our thing is alright how do we we know we're going to you know we're doing this basically so we can hang out with each other <laughs> because yeah. you know we live in every single member of the band lives in a different city or continent which is unique uh, and so we're basically doing it to hang out with each other and connect with the fans you're not going to connect with the fans by having 50 pound t-shirts so um, you I'm know, playing for ten minutes and then walking off stage. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm gathering the uh, I'm gathering. There's no meet and greet then. <laughs> you know there is, and we didn't do that to try and be exclusive or exclusionary. We just the moment. So I I, I took <clears throat> pictures from Facebook and on Twitter and stuff just so that no schmuck could take them and post. Yeah. Na- Nazi nonsense, you know. And I just kind of let them lie dormant for a decade since the last show. And then when we knew they were doing these shows, I kind of reanimated the corpses of the social media. And there's just been this like massive outpouring uh, of people that say we want to meet the band, right? And we don't yeah. want to try. We don't want to try and hang out after the show when you're probably going to be bailing in the rain and the snow to get five minutes with you. Can you make it happen? 
so we had a lot of discussions with that with with DHP and with the venues and with our team to say, all right, what's the best way that we can guarantee that people get to meet the band, get their stuff signed, it's a safe environment for everyone, and it's not as we run by somewhere on an overnight drive. And the kind of consensus from all involved was, and the fans actually, you know, led by them was, can you do a meet and greet? Right. So we did a crazy cheap, we've done a crazy cheap, what we're calling a VIP ticket. You get, you get a t-shirt, a lanyard with a VIP session pass thing and you get a signed poster and you get to meet with us for 50 minutes and take selfies with the band. And it's, I mean, it's peanuts. It'll probably but only just break even. It doesn't make any additional money when you add up the cost of the shirt and all that stuff. Yeah. But it, it was just to try and make that happen per fan request. So we are actually doing that, but it's not like a, you know, when you, I live in the States now and you see that for Aerosmith and it's like $2,000. To, yeah. to meet the band and have a selfie with them it's more like I can't remember what it is it's an old ticket it's peanuts it's peanuts more than a regular show ticket to make that happen and again that's to make it happen in a safe environment and to give those fans what they actually asked for they were like well we don't want to try and chase you down when you run into the tour bus in the rain we want to tell you about our pitch shifter experiences and we want to get that special pat I've had since 1980 signed you know, yeah. but we want to bring with us and make sure it doesn't get crushed in the pit and all that stuff. So <clears throat> that's kind of the way that we figured that out. Yeah, no, well, that, yeah, that's fair get, enough. Yeah, that's fair I enough. Get like, rich so, off that either. But like you said, you know, you're responding. You're responding to, um, you know, you're responding to what uh, what people want, and um, and I completely get that as well because it's been a long time since you played, and it's going to be a very long time if you ever play again. And so that that one-off opportunity, it, it's worth making it available for people who really want to do it. Yeah, and I can't remember how much it is. You can see how invested I am in the money. I don't know how much it is, but it's not very, Do, not very much. Let's look it up. I was Let's gonna, look it up on the power was, of the interweb. I, I was going to say, talking. well, I'll tell you what, while you're looking that up, um, uh, I did have a, um, a, a question from a listener um, and it was, uh, it's kind of twofold question. Firstly, um, who do you think would be the best bands to come out of Nottingham? I'm presuming he means other than yourselves. And, um, have I you, do. have you, band, have you heard of an old Knots band from the nineties called Die Low or Daylo, D-A-I and Low, yes. L-O? Yes. We uh, pronounce it Die Low, but I could be wrong. So there's only Pitch Shifter and Black Lace who dig Aga do. Aga do, do some bullshit and shake the tree. Aga do, 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 yeah. Which is a couple of dudes with very questionable mullets. Uh, and yeah. Like suits with the sleeves rolled up, which is never a good look, unless you're Don Johnson. Um, so they had that, the biggest song, I think. And then there's us, which are like underground weirdos. But I do remember Dialo, yeah. But I think Pitch Shifter and uh, Black Lace Christmas Tour would be amazing. Oh, well, you, well, you'd have to have Lawmo Death opening for you. <laughs> and Lawmo Death. But there are loads of bands. What about freaking Concrete Socks? I don't know if they're still alive. Oh, fucking hell, there's a blast from the past. Yeah, Concrete Socks. We were on Ear 8 with them way back in the day. I mean, we used to play with Johnny Morrow and, and, and uh, Iron Monkey, obviously, R.I.P. Johnny Morrow. But um, there was kind of a little scene, tiny little scene back in the day, even in Nottingham. Concrete Socks did that first uh, split seven inch with um, on Ear 8. God, who was it with? No. I'm too old. I can't remember this stuff. I can't, I can't help you. Well, there was Sabat as well. Yeah. Who, of course, now have a guitarist in Judas Priest. So um, <laughs> that's just fucking weird. It was Concrete Socks and Heresy. Ah, Heresy. Right, okay. Split single on, on uh, Ear Break. It was like Mosh 002 was the number. I can't remember what Mosh 001 was. Probably made Palm Death. Let's have a butcher's hook. Like I remember seeing um I remember seeing Heresy. I went to the Nottingham Garage and it was Heresy, um Napalm Death, Holy Terror and D R I. Um and I think that was eight, I think that was eighty six or eighty seven and that night I got to meet John Peel. John Peel was a god. We met we we did like three Peel sessions, but they never got released. We did them with uh, Dale What's his face, the drummer from Mark the Hoople on as the producer, yeah, we got we got invited to John Peel a number of times, and 
I remember I was stumbling around uh, Reading or Glaston Fant Festival one time and I just bumped into him. He goes, oh, hello. I said, oh, hello. And we just sat down and got chatting about music for ages. It was awesome. Uh, I was, I mean, um, I, 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 yeah. Great loss. A great loss to the country, Mr. Pierce. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I only, I only got to chat to him for about 10 or 15 minutes, but he was a lover because I was wearing a Descendants shirt and I was explaining to him the whole, you know, I was into the Descendants because I heard him on the Peel show. Um, when we when we got the demo, when we got our Moschenstein demo, we sent him that and he played it. And I made sure he got a copy of the album and the thanks on it uh, when it came out. And and in his in his record collection online, because you can go to John Peel's record collection online and you can flick through a, you know A to Z. And um, and our albums in there. And that's for me. That is one of the highlights of our entire fucking career. Yeah, there's a few things like that, like uh, J- uh, James O'Barr who was the guy that wrote the original graphic novel of The Crow, he name-checked Bit Shifter in the intro. Oh, nice. So you get, yeah, you get stuff like that, and you're like, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. To- you know, totally un- un- you know, unsolicited. And someone said, hey, have you seen The Crow? And when it first came out, graphic novel prior to all the movies, I was like, no, why? And it's like, you get name-checked in the intro. I'm like, what? The stuff like that's super cool. It is, isn't it? Because it's it's just it, and that's that's exactly how you find out as well. You usually find out through somebody else. You know, someone says like, "Oh, have you? Did you know this? Or you know, have you have you seen that? Or did you know so and so was a fan?" And you're like, "Really? Wow!" And that's yeah. And I remember, I remember, I remember. I read an I read an interview in in some rock magazine, and the drummer from ZZ Top said, "Yeah, I've been influenced by Pitch Shifter recently." <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> ZZ Top? Yeah, I know. I was like. Is he top? I know, you, you, you know, mad things happen. You just roll with it. Yeah, well, you got to, haven't you? I mean, it's like, but that's it. That's and that's something I don't think you appreciate when you're in it and you're doing it at the time. You, you, you kind of, you, you never know who's listening, and it's not till years later that you that you find out who was listening. You know, and um, it's kind of weird because it does. It filters back to you in bits and pieces. Um, and uh, do you remember the band Wizard? Yes. Wizard. Yeah. I was at I was at some event and the and the the singer with the long purple hair and the purple glasses and yeah. the beard kind of looked like a wizard. He comes up to me, and goes, "Hello," and I go, "You're the singer from Wizard," and he goes, "You're the singer from Pitch Shifter." And I'm like, "How the hell do you know that?" And he goes, "My daughter is a massive fan. She's here. Can she meet you?" Uh, stuff like that. And I remember one time Jim and me, when Jim was in the band, we were I can't remember what we were doing. We were recording something or we did a session or something. We stayed at an hotel in London, and Noddy Holden was in there. And we stayed up all night at the bar drinking with Noddy Holden. Oh, man. So the slave. How freaking awesome is that? We're they, like, yo, Noddy Holden! They, they, they are the, <laughs> Have a drink on us! Yeah, they, they, are the, they are the nights that you remember, aren't they? They are the, little, the, the, the quirky little things where it's like, you're fucking joking. I remember meeting, um, was it Andy Crane, the uh, TV uh, presenter, you know, the, yeah, yeah, he was yeah. in the broom cupboard before Philip Schofield. And he turned up to one of our gigs and we were like, really? fucking hell, we got him in the dressing room afterwards. And it was like, look, this is like our own broom cupboard. And we're all getting pictures with him. It was just fucking ridiculous. My favourite one is <clears throat> is my ACDC story. I tell people I met Angus Young. They're like, no way. So how did it go down? I'm like, well, it was at the Kerrang Awards. And I was taking a piss. <clears throat> and Angus Young walks in and he took a piss next to me and I'm looking, I'm like, fuck me, that's Angus Young. I'm like, urinal etiquette dictates that I'm not supposed to talk to him in case he thinks I'm looking at his pecker. Yeah. But it's Angus Young. So I'm like, i got to do it. And I go, and the only thing I think to say is I go, you're Angus Young. And he goes, you're that dude in Pitch Shifter what won that best video award. Wow. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that was it. That was my Angus Young experience. Oh wow, mate! That's uh, hey, th- those are the days. Those are the days. Who know? Who knows who's going to be t- turning up to this th- to this tour? Do you know what I mean? You, you, you're uh, you're, you're going to be surprised. You're going to be surprised. Yeah, I've got no. I've literally got no idea. We've got no idea whether it's all going to be our crowd or whether it's going to be a mix. Or just, I mean, like I say, ticket sales are robust, so there's going to be people there. I just don't know what type of people. We'll see. We'll see how they've weathered. See how many divorces they're on. Oh, you're going to be you're going to be meeting uh, parents who are bringing their kids, who are going to be giving it the old. Oh, we never thought we'd get a chance. You know, 
We never thought I'd get a chance to bring my kids and see Pitch Shifter. This is going to be, you know. Those, those poor little bastards. Yes, yeah. I, well, I, I, I was introduced to, I was introduced to uh, somebody's son. He goes, oh, this is his first acid rain experience. And, and the dude's like 17 and about a foot and a half taller than me. It's just... probably like, I have no concept of what this is. Yeah. Because I grew up in the era of swapping right and post Malone. Yes, yeah, yeah, and, and all that stuff. Um, but uh, no, it's, I, 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 I'm just really pleased to see you guys doing this because um, it's been so long. And um, yeah, and the, 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 the website kind of sort of there were a few updates and then it just went it just went really quiet but life goes on doesn't it and you know it, you you have you have shit to do as opposed to update an old pitch shifter website you know we owned pitchshifter.com for such a long time it was kind of like a a banksy thing of burning your artwork that we all decided my brother and i decided we were going to let it go i think some japanese company bought it and it's to do with vitamins to make children grow now but it was one of those things of, am I going to own PitchSister.com forever? Like, do I literally have to renew this forever and just own it, even though there's nothing live on it, forever? Or is it something that we can let go to move on? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was kind of like it was kind of like spending ages finishing the painting that you think is your masterpiece and then setting it on fire so that you could be released from it and maybe do something better next time. So we kind of made a conscious decision to let it go, which. It was befuddled tons of people. Why would you ever do that? Blah, blah, blah. You bought that in 1996. Yeah. But it was just something that we kind of needed to do, and it was liberating to do. I mean, I've got, I've got two-inch masters of the first album on tape. Wow. I mean, like, yeah. I'm, everyone's like, oh, you can never get rid of those. I'm like, what am I going to do with them? You can't ever play them on anything. Yeah. It's like saying I've got the original eight tracks. I've got the original eight tracks for this. They're just, they're useless, but, you know, you hang on to these things and kind of the website was important for us. We were like, okay, we're going to let this go out into the wild and become other people. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let it go, let it go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did to be I... honest, uh, you know, I've had more engagement on social media, like websites are dragged to maintain. Yes. We've had way more engagement on social media and it's easy. I can just do it from my phone. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we have, we have a website at the moment, but it, it's kind of like it, it, it's rapidly outliving its usefulness because social media is the place to go. Cause we will, you know, we'll post nearly every day on, on social media. If you want to know what's exactly. going on, go there. You know, exactly. Um, so, uh, well, so Ross, speaking of two inch masters and stuff, did I read somewhere that you've, you found some old songs kicking around, some old demos? <laughs> yeah. So in like 2006 or 2007, we were genuinely going to do a seventh studio album. We we're all gung ho for it. So we did them. We did some demos and I couldn't remember. I don't think we sang vocals anymore. We did like scratch vocals on some of them and then <clears throat> life got in the way and other stuff. We never completed it. So Prior to this tour, my brother said, oh, can you look in the vault? So I literally went into the under, under vault of my garage's garage, and I found a G5 Apple Mac tower computer, the computer that's as big as a suitcase, 10 to 20. But it's not been turned on since 2006. So I hit the button, and it comes on, and I go to the songs folder, and it's got these all these songs that we wrote, and two of them have got, one of them's got vocals on. So I find it, and I... And the fans are like mad for it. They're like, oh my God, make it available. So I shove it on Bandcamp for a quid because, you know, for the punk thing, I don't really want to be like, oh, it's $10,000 each. <laughs> so I shove it on Bandcamp for a quid and those people are like, this is freaking amazing. You must do another album. I'm like, we're not going to do another album. <laughs> not gonna... There's too much going on in the rest of our lives to drop it all and go back to doing this. And we did it for a very long time. And then the other day I found another one. So I'm not, I'm not chucking that one on Bandcamp. I said thank you to, and no disrespect to fans that can't make the tour, but as a thank you for those that are going to be physically present, if you buy a T-shirt at the next booth, I'm going to give you that song for free as a digital download for the first 666 people. There's no reason why we chose that number whatsoever. It's just... <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's kind of a little Robin Hood giveaway. Like, you're going to come to the show and buy a shirt. You're going to get, you're going to get a free song.
song that no one can get because it was never released. And it's, I love stuff like that. Cool. It makes people feel special. And like I say, we're not going to get rich out of selling a few T-shirts, but as a thank you for those people that do, that help to pay for the tour, they'll get this little nugget that no one else in the world can get. Well, I look forward to getting my copy because I will be coming along to London and I will be buying a shirt because your old play Satan, your old play Satan shirt, Jesus, I wore that till it fell apart. Um, and the amount that was a, that was we had we we did a few we did like a like a Satan Buddha I don't know if you got that one it was like a smile we we took an old illustration of of smiling Jesus smiling Caucasian Jesus like um, with loads of kids around him smiling at him. And switched the head out for Satan, <laughs> just because we knew it would offend lots of people. And it wasn't pitch shift; it was just like PSI or whatever. But we would sell them, and they were not branded. I don't think it was branded at all, right? It didn't say pitch shift or PSI. No, like, no, it, it wasn't. It, it was. It was. It said play Satan across the uh, across the top, and there was a couple. There was a couple of like satanic symbols. Um, I think on the back it might have said pitch shifter somewhere or it just had like a little joystick with pitch shifter on or something on the back i think it said because it said i think the original playstation tagline was do not underestimate the power of playstation and i think it just said on the back do not underestimate the power of play satan it was like an it was just an art bonkers art experiment because they're all arty creative types so it was just that and we checked it out but we People loved that shirt, and they also yeah. loved the Satan family one because yeah, it's but, so offensive. But I loved it's like all the smiling, happy children at Satan's feet. You know, people are like you can't. This is an outrage. You know, that's freaking hilarious. It's, but it's all—it's very Dead Kennedys. It's very punk, and the idea of putting shirts out without the band name on is—is is just. It is, it's fucking class because it is it's just like it's a t-shirt that you can wear and the amount of times people said oh that's a really cool shirt you know what that's really oh where can I get one of those and it's like well you can't I got it at a gig oh what band uh, Pitch Shifter right not Play Satan then the no be- no the best that. the best band shirt I saw the best band shirt I saw for a very very long time was the first Fugazi shirt and he said this is not a Fugazi shirt <laughs> nice and simple. I just thought that was genius. Like, this is not a Fugazi sticker. This is not a Fugazi shirt. <laughs> In, like, super plain Helvetica letter and, like, white on black. A total genius. Well, it, well, funnily enough, we did... Um, I didn't know that. Um, and that's, I, we, did a, um, we did a baseball shirt for our... Um, for a comeback tour. And it, and it just says on the front, I am not in acid rain. And we just thought that was quite amusing for people to be like just tons of people walking around wearing these shirts saying I'm not in acid rain. Um, I think we used to have one that said death to pitch shifter. (laughs) 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 There's nothing on the back. It was a black shirt and white letter and it said death to pitch shifter. You see people walking around. I find that kind of stuff. I like, you know, as an English gent, I find that self-deprecating humour very amusing. Yeah, I absolutely. Abs- I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> we do we do it very well. We do it better than any other nation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's all about having a sense of humour about some, yourself, there's isn't some, it? There's some, interesting, there's some interesting stuff that we're doing on this tour. We, we've done a retro shirt, a couple of shirts. We've done some tour date shirts. Brilliant. There's... um. I'm going to do a hoodie because it's freezing there and people have asked for beanie hats because it's freezing so we're going to do those and then there's one uh, there's one very funny item that nobody knows about yet I'll spill the beans for you Ooh. tea towels oh brilliant brilliant <laughs> nothing you know we come from the punk era where you get your deck chair out in sex pistols and you get your roll your pant legs up and put an Aussie Danky on your head and smoke a cigarette so We've done a tea towel just because I think it's fucking hilarious and it's very English. It's uh, I'm gonna have to. But as you can imagine, it's quite it's quite punk rock imagery on it. So, are you going to be doing pitch shifter shopping bags to put all this fucking stuff in? <laughs> no, there's <laughs> nothing I hate more in the world than tote bags. I can't tell you, America's mad for tote bags. You buy yeah. a freaking if you buy a one penny chew, they give you a freaking tote bag to put it in. It's reusable. You can use it. I've got four hundred of them. Nobody yeah. needs this many tote bags. Stop making them, for God's sake. Whenever, whenever I see one, I whenever I see one, I just think it's a PE bag from the fucking 70s, right. 80s. You know, you used to have to put your PE yeah. kit in it. Um, exactly. I'm, I, just, I'm, I'm like, I've got no tote bag rule. <laughs> no yeah. tote bags. 
No, no, but no. yeah, we'll see. I did a super, I did a super, super limited amount of tea towels. I think it's fucking hilarious. So we'll see if anybody finds them as hilarious as us. <laughs> well, hey, look. Ultimately, what's the worst thing that can happen? You end, you end, you end up with a load, with a load of tea of towels. <laughs> yeah, you never need to buy another tea towel in your life. <laughs> no, I'm, if, if they don't sell, I'm, I'm developing a tea towel cannon, like a shirt cannon that I can fire at gigs. It's very northern. There'll be Lipton tea and the and the tea towel and the tea towel cannon. It's it, it's definitely got the sound of an eBay business. Uh, pitch shifter tea towels at the end of the tour. <laughs> That'd be great. So, have you? Um, uh, uh, are you? So, are you still um, tutoring? By the way, and by the way, I'm very conscious that um, uh, our, our time is running out rapidly. Yes, sorry, it is. Am I, I still? Um, sorry, yeah. Sorry, I lost uh, the question. Sorry, are you still? Um, are you still tutoring? Tutoring how? Um, you were doing, um, so we kind of start like a music and and, mu- and sort of music and commerce um, uh, course for a while. I read that somewhere. So I was rolling around here, drunk in the middle of the day. Are you still there? <laughs> I am indeed. Yes. Okay. So for a while, um, I was. Uh, uh, music school, right? And so I was trying to use trying to use my powers for good to help people not make all the same mistakes I made and get ripped off and all the dumb stuff that all musicians tell you. So I was actually at Musicians Institute in LA for a long time. I worked my way up to vice president of academic affairs, and um, I resigned there on good terms, but I just felt that it was time for me to not do that anymore. So. I wasn't teaching per se because I was kind of over everyone, but um, I had a great time there for a very long time and helped to shape their curriculum to kind of help the new world of musicians come up and kind of stand on our shoulders and not have to make the same mistakes that we made. So that was a super positive experience for me. I'm still in higher education, but I don't work at music schools anymore. I kind of progressed more into higher education proper. Ah, right. So we sounds very, we sounds very grown up. I know. <laughs> yes. So it's not what I was expecting. You have caught me off guard there. Right. So you. So well, unbeknownst, unbeknownst to many of our fans, you know, Mark and I, have, we both have master's degrees, and we both work in higher education. Right. So you will find that a lot of miscreants and creative weirdos like Martin Atkins and Carl. Carl actually, Carl Middleton from Earth 09 runs a music school in America. We all end up in higher education because that's where free thinkers are allowed to think freely. <laughs> and it's where you can actually use your powers for the most good. That makes absolute so sense. You'll, so you'll you'll find quite a lot of creatives end up in higher ed. You could one could postulate that it's a haven for scoundrels. However, <laughs> I like to think I like to think of the, it's where creative thinkers are allowed to creatively think. And I was in the private sector, and I'd, I've done for profit businesses and other stuff, and made money in yada schmada. But this is where I think best fits with my kind of life ethos and the punk of the band is helping people to progress as individuals through the power of higher education. Yeah. My, both, my brother and I are first-time graduates, so neither of our parents went to college. My dad left school at 15 because his dad got sick and he had to work construction to pay the bills. And my mom never went to college because she was looking after us as kids. So we're super working class, and my brother and I had the first in in our family to go to college. So <clears throat> for me, I wanted to help people who didn't have any support system like us to go through that to kind of make life better because otherwise the rich pigs will stay rich forever and the upper class will stay upper class forever and nothing will ever change. Which sounds quite lofty. I'll step off my soapbox, but <laughs> that's how you end up with a lot of creative types in higher ed. Yeah. 
because you can help to shape things more than you could do by trying to become a millionaire and well that's it money making money is its own reward right well yeah as 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 you've uh, as you've very succinctly put there um that just keeps that just keeps the status quo um right. you know it, it just reinforces it and uh, and i think it's very it's very worthy sir um and it, you know uh, i more power to you and and um you know, I, it's. I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys um, at the second London show. I will be there. I shall make my, my, my myself known at some point um, if I see yeah. you. Yeah. And um, look, I'm stocked up on I'm stocked up on ibuprofen and depends. So hopefully I'll get through most of the show. <laughs> well, um, well, yeah. Let's yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully you'll survive. Hopefully you'll live long enough to play the Nottingham show because it'd be it'd be pretty sad exactly. if you did. You know. <laughs> Kind, exactly. kind of regret, kind of regretting putting that on the end now, are we? Well, well, we'll see. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to be that show's going to be bonkers and probably emotional too. I think at that point we'll all realise, hey, this is probably the last time we're ever going to do this, and it's a lot of us. Carl, Carl from Earthstone's flying in from Detroit. I'm flying in from LA. Mark, uh, Dan, and Tim, Dan. Dan works all over the world doing AV stuff. So he was in Dubai the other day in Berlin. He'll be flying in from somewhere for it. So I think even though we're all English gents that suffer in silence with stiff upper lip and all that, I think not only will Nottingham be bonkers, but I think it has the potential to be a bit emotional. Yeah. <laughs> I think mean, that'll be, we'll realize, all right, this is it. You know what I mean? Ab- absolutely. Well, yeah, speaking as speaking as somebody who went to see uh, Slayer for the very last time two nights ago, having seen them once every couple of years since I was 17 years old. Um, yeah, they, these things do have a kind of a, a, an emotional hold over you. And especially when it's something that you're going to, you know, all those memories are going to flood it, come flooding back and then it's all going to disappear again. Exactly. It will go super fast, but we'll see. Like. Like I said, I think everyone's doing it for the right reasons. And I think the crowd is there for the right reason. They just want to connect. They're not coming to see us because we're the new latest thing on the cover of Fancy Pants magazine. It's because they, want, they like the band and they want to connect with it. So I think every, the good news is everyone that's there from the band and the crew and the crowd and the promoter are all actually there for the right reasons. So it's got the groundwork to just be a lot of fun and good without any of the usual trappings and horror of the music business. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really hope I really hope so, and I'm 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 sure it's going to be a huge success. And um, uh, and uh, and yeah, look, I really appreciate your time. I know you've got a meeting to get to, so um, thanks for taking the time out. And um, I'll see you in London. Yes, thank you, sir. Shoot me a link to this, and I'll I'll get the guys to post it on social media. Um, I will do. Unfortunately, it's probably it's going to be out after the tour, which is a bit of a shame. But no um, but I'll, I'll anyway. I, I will I will ping it over to you as soon as it's done. Good man. Okay, mate. I'll say hello in London. Yeah, will do. All right. See ya. See ya. Bye. Bye bye. And there you have uh, my chat uh, with J.S. Clayton of Pitch Shifter. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that. I uh, really enjoyed doing it. And as you can hear, we had um, yeah, we kind of wandered off down all sorts of alleyways. Um, Definitely doing um, uh, the uh, the old uh, the old reformation for all the right reasons, and um, uh, just really really good. That there's that whole um, as we talked about the whole sort of punk punk rock kind of DIY ethic go, running right through what they've done, well what they're doing now, what they what they've always done, and I do think that will be the the very last chance anyone's going to get to um, to see that happen. So um, hope you got there if you're a fan. I really hope you're not just hearing about it now. So um, now onto a, onto my chat with somebody who's not on the podcast, but I did spend a good hour and a half having a chat with and a really good laugh, and that would be my old mate Bruce Dickinson. <laughs> yep, um, um, I I was doing the last night of the uh, of the pub quiz um, at his local. Um, uh, they're, they're someone else. They they booted the company I work for anyway. So. Um, uh, so yeah, um, and um, some of his friends um, were, are, are a kind of regular team, and they uh, they got him to come. So he, so he played the second half of the quiz, and then we uh, and then we got to hang out afterwards, and it was fucking awesome. Um, got, we're talking about his solo show a lot, the spoken word show. I mean, he's he's re- really into the idea of doing something doing something trippy with that, and, and just doing something that really kind of 
you know, freaks people out, which was very, very cool. Um, and um, he is uh, he's not a fan of meet and greets at all, I can tell you that. <laughs> Not at all. We had a right old chat about all sorts. I can't remember how meet and greets sort of came up in the um, uh, in the discussion. And funnily enough, a friend of mine had um, him and his son had gone to a talk that Bruce was doing um, for young aspiring pilots, and my mates, my best mate's son, um, was, was there for it. And then they came over to me, and off we went to see Slayer's last ever gig. So I was telling him about that, and he was like, "Oh, it was per- per- perfect symmetry." And uh, yeah, it was just, it was just really, really cool. Um, had a had a really good chat, um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not claiming that I'm, <laughs> I'm not claiming that you know we're we're best mates or anything like that. Um, but it was just, it was just very, very, very cool. Um, and he was, yeah, he was uh, an absolute gent, really good laugh. Um, and yeah, like I said, we got to hang out for about about ninety minutes and um, and 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 talk about all sorts of shit. It was it was really 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 cool. Um, and uh, I, I've got a big smile on my face telling you all about it. Um, and um, <laughs> so from from what from one really cool guy to a guy I've never met. Um, this time it's not Gene Simmons. No, it is Paul Stanley. Yes, what a quote. Paul Stanley on ki- on why Kiss decided to call it quits. We can only be this good <laughs> for so long. Now, that can be read many ways depending on the way you feel about Kiss. Um, and um, I, I just thought that was quite an amusing sort of... Um, uh, just, a, 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 just an amusing little... Um, uh, fr- uh, oh, God... Soundbite. That's the word. Soundbite. Um, when we come to your town, it's over. The night we play at any city, that's goodbye. That's farewell. The tour is going to be on for two or three years because it's a big world. And over 45 years, we've played a lot of places. And we want to visit them one more time and spend that e- the evening with those people. I'm sure you do. And then in comes Jean. Privately, we have the best time in the world. It's the best party you could ever want to go to. Wrong. This party's existed for 45 years. Imagine being able to wear more makeup and higher heels than even your mummy. Imagine to get up on stage. Um, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I get to be in Kiss, the hottest band on earth. There's nothing like that. Okay. We get along great. For anybody who thinks that this is not, uh, that, that this is not the last tour, there are people who are, 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 believe the earth is flat. That's okay. Believe what you want to believe. It's not okay to believe the world is flat. You're a fucking idiot. We want to go out on top. Well, it's a bit late for that, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, I, I am really, really running out of things to say about, uh, about uh, Gene and Paul, apart from... Please make it your last tour. Please, please make this, be this the last tour ever. That would be fucking great. And moving swiftly on, I have to steer you in the direction of the Jamie Jaster podcast and the episode where he has Jake E. Lee on it. Um... It's because it, uh, any of you who know the the, the Just podcast is he, he does tend to go on about the check, getting the check, getting the cosign from a big a, a, a bigger band, or getting the check, get some money and get the check. And he's always apologising for always going on about money, but then always goes on about money. Um, and I and I get it, I get it. You know, it, it be, being who he is, and he's you know, and, and like I said, being self employed myself has made me appreciate his standpoint a lot more. And the guy's ultimately really hard working. And if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have the great decent Yard album. But but you can go on about money a bit too much, and it really happened in the interview with Jakey Lee. Jasta decided to uh, say, "Well, why why don't you get Badlands back together? Why don't you get Bad? You know, and the, the singer Eric is dead." Um, why don't you get back? You know, I'm sure there's there's people out there. And he's like, no, I couldn't do that because Eric's, you know, Eric's no longer with us. Yeah, but you know, you could get you could get somebody new, and you know, you could you you, you could you could do the you know you could do it. There's the you know, you, man, you'd you'd fill these venues. You know, there's there, there's you know, there's a lot of money in it. There's a, you know, there's a big check, and you know, you could do it. And Jakey Lee just turns around and says, but J- uh, um, Jamie, to chase money is not a noble pursuit. Oh, man, what a fucking line! What a line! 
But Jamie carries on unabated. Yeah, but man, you know, you could, you could, you could, um, you could do it, and you could, you could do it for charity, and you could leave that, you could leave money, you know. And he's like, no, I couldn't do it. I wouldn't want to do it. It's just, it, it's a great moment. I mean, the interview continues, and um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Jamie does his best, um, and, and it's, I mean it's a really cool interview. I've got to be honest. And he, look, he, do, I, I might, I'm, I'm, un, I, I mean, I might be having a go. At, uh, I am I having a go at Jamie Jaster? I don't know. Is it allowed? I don't know. Anyway, you know, send him a fucking, send him a fucking clip, and if he gives a shit, I'll, you know, with any luck, he'll slag me off, and um, we'll get exposed to more people, and the podcast will become even bigger. Bigger. Ah, yes. There we go. I knew there was a reason to do this. So anyway. Um, it is now time, it is now time to move to move on to one of my favourite people. It's none other than Emma Barnett. That's, she is a DJ with Total Rock. She'll tell you all about her show during the interview. But um, we, just, uh, we just talked about metal. Um, last time that um, uh, we had a chance to speak, she was interviewing me. That was when Acid Rain had just come back. You'll hear all about that in the interview. And we cover um, everything, absolutely everything to do with the business. It's just a right, it's just a right good old chat about metal. Two people having a, a real old chat about metal. And that is what this, this podcast is all about. It's people talking about metal. Because that's what we've all got in common, let's face it. That's what we all love. And that's what I'm not going to be playing on the end of the show, because I can't anymore. Um, by the way, before I go into this, I just wanted to say that um, you will be able to listen to Bollocks Radio before anyone else gets it. You will also be able to download it. If you sign up at patreon.com forward slash Howard H. Smith, that's right, you get the, you get the podcast early. Um, so Patreon subscribers will be getting this the day I'm recording it, which is Sunday the 25th of November. You guys won't be getting it till later in the week, probably Friday. Um, they get their own uh, bollocast, which is a completely uh, a, a, another thing that only goes up there. They get loads of all sorts of other bits and pieces, acid rain goodies. So if you like the sound of that, get over to patreon.com forward slash Howard H. Smith. It's just five dollars a month. Jesus Christ, that is less than a pint of beer. It's slightly more than one coffee. And every month you get a shit load of, um, uh, of content. And you also get this first and you will get the radio show first and it'll be down downloadable as well. Wow, what a treat that is for everybody. Anyway, without further ado, let me stop plug it, plugging me and let's go straight in to my chat with Emma Barnett of Total Rock. Hello. Hi love, how are you doing? I'm really well, how are you? Good, how's um the levels? All good your end? Uh, I'm, I'm always good my end mate. <laughs> We're, we're off to a banger already, I see. Um, uh, yeah, okay, ab- cool. Absolutely. You, you, all of a sudden, you're going to remember about you're going to remember what that uh, chat of ours in 2015, believe it or not, was all was all about. Oh my god, really? That long ago? Wow. I was just looking through our um, our messaging history on Facebook. Um, I say that like there's a huge history. There isn't. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah it was it was back it was July 2015, um, and you were interviewing me and. Um, and here we are, you know, shoes on the other foot now, girl. Yeah, well, I was I was in California then, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so you were. crazy times. You... I think you had just announced um, a tour or some, something was going on with you guys. And I was like, oh, my God, yeah. Rash Legends, Acid Rain, I've got to get involved. So, oh, that's very yeah. kind of you. No, we're, um, we, um, I think we'd, well, we'd announced the, that we were coming back and we'd probably announced the... Um, that we were going to be touring with Zentrix and and playing that some dates, it. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's all 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 good in that camp, mate. Um, we've we've got uh, uh, the mix is being worked on at the moment of the new album, so it's um, it's all in full flight. Nice. Well, let me give let me know when it what's all happening and give yeah. me a shout when when you want it like thrown out to the world and all that jazz. Oh, so, I will. Oh, I will. Of course, do. I'm gonna gonna help you out. Oh, be done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so, yeah, California, and now you're back in um, you're back in smelly old London, where where I am. I'm in actually Southampton, so less. Oh, I don't know if it's less smelly. Um, <laughs> probably less polluted, I would imagine. But yeah, I'm actually deep south. 
the deepest of south. Um, yeah, so there's, it's all right down there. There's a bit of a metal scene, you know, not a, a grand sizing that is in London, but you know, there's some things happening here, so it's well, not all bad. Well, put it, we'll put it this way. Um, it, we, would you have been in Southampton in April 2017? No. No? Well, if you had been, you would have been one extra person at our gig. Um, <laughs> so- Southampton has been retired from our touring schedule, put it that way. Mm, mm, yeah. Just... Although, yeah, I saw Voivod recently and they, they were pretty good at the joiners. Where did you play? Um, I think it's closed down now. Um, oh, I can't even remember the name. Um, it's on some tour dates somewhere. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was, I mean, don't get me wrong. It was an awesome venue. And they said they'd like, they'd had 400 in for Exodus. Um, and, uh, I mean, we, we scraped just over 50, I think. Um, oh man. I know. Oh, is it, it was... uh, Talking Heads? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they only shut down recently, but yeah, shame that. Yeah. So it was a good venue. I remember going there once and they had like a jam night and you used to have traffic lights and if you were shit, it would go instantly to red. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> like totally brutal, but at the same time, like jokes as well, because you'd be uh, like, oh my God, just make it go red now, please. <laughs> I know. I've, done, I've done enough gong shows in my time, well, many years ago, when I was starting out as a comedian, that is brutal. I tell you, when you mm. get when it, when you're getting gonged off, you know, on your own, no instruments. <laughs> do you know what I mean? People just go, "Nah, fuck off, you're not funny." It's like, all right, okay, <laughs> I'll uh, I'll just get I'll just. It's, get... When it, it's like green for a bit, and then it flicks to amber really quickly, and then within no time, it's like red. Out you go, like oh yeah, <laughs> brutal times. Well, but if you if you're playing music, it was more like music even worse because you're like pouring your heart out you know what i mean like... yeah well well yeah i mean you, but comedy you can be you know it, it's it, it, it uh, invariably jokes it, you know it's, it's the same comes from a kind of similar artistic place which mm. is which is truth you know and and um it's uh, subjective like any art form you yeah. know it's that's the way it rolls i think you have to it well artists are people who reach <clears> inside <throat> and put it out there for people to to enjoy and um you know ultimately it's it, you know depending on how much of yourself you want to reveal um comedy can be um yeah um some people use it as a form of therapy <laughs> uh, um I... get it all out there just get it out you know <laughs> oh yeah absolutely absolutely but um <clears throat> so um so you're back in southampton now but you're you're but you're still the queen of total rock I don't know about that. I, I, I do my best, you know. I, I don't like to blow my own trumpet or anything, but, yeah, smashing out the interviews recently. So, yeah, it's, it's good, man. You know, I do it out of passion, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. I organise everything myself and, you know, the, the painstaking amount of uh, albums that you get sent, that sounds really harsh, but you know how it rolls. No, um, no, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I've, I've had to put my Facebook on secret agent mode because, you know, that's a thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, everyone adds you and then they're like, oh, and by the way, can you listen to my new band, please? Yeah. Like, oh, here we go, that, that old chestnut. Um, yeah. But, yeah, no, so, <clears throat> you know, I like here, I like finding out about new bands and stuff like that and well, pretty enough, much anything that Relapse put out I'm always down with so yeah you know it's like you just filter through things and what hits your radar and I've got it kind of the show's based around my filter and what my tastes are which I think I hope people <laughs> share the same joy as I do musically so yeah I've been you know I've been listening to metal now since I was like 11. Uh, the first time I ever heard a riff was probably about nine that I realized, hey, I like that sound. Um, but the first ever, ever was uh, actually the LucasAid advert, which <laughs> starred um, the one and only Iron Maiden, uh, Phantom of the Opera, I think oh, when I was about shit, I remember that. Yeah. five. Yeah, <clears throat> when, when I heard that. And that's when I remember specifically turning up the TV, running over, because that's before remotes, 
Um, yeah, that's how old I am. Uh, and uh, it's turning right. it up. You're and younger than me, don't worry like, about Oh, my God. So, yeah. yeah. Just, and then, um, yeah, just it being on radio, radio all the time. We always had the radio on in our house. So, yeah, just a multitude. My, my uncle was a punk as well, so... I kind of had that force fed down my throat, uh, pistols and buzzcocks and um, two tone specials and stuff like that when I was when yeah. I was a kid. So yeah, I've kind of. But my dad's the rocker, my mum's the soul soul queen. So I've got a mixed bag of yeah background musically. But yeah, so I just remember my dad buying this second hand car and it had CZ Top on Tape Eliminator and we just played it to death. So, yeah, you know, just kids. The 80s was uh, full of um, metal and it was it was more popular back then. So, I don't know, it was more in the charts and stuff. You were more exposed to the guitar sound, I think. But, yeah, yeah. ma'am. Right, know. I tell you what, a load of people listening uh, have just suddenly transported back in time remembering <laughs> the, uh, the LucasAid um, Phantom of the Opera advert. Because that is like, I mean, I, I remember it, but that, it, you know, you've totally triggered me there. I'd completely mm. forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah. Just... I often, um, when I explain that this is the first thing I ever heard, I will get the video up on YouTube and people are like, whoa. Because, you know, even back then it was like having um, Daley Thompson as well yeah. on an advert, like just the whole thing was like so compelling as a child. Um yeah. So yeah, and I've just featured the red, amber, and green lights as well. Which <laughs> <laughs> see that has segue there. Come Brilliant. on, get in. Brilliant. You know, but um, <laughs> she's a pro. She's definitely you're definitely a pro. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah. So you know, it's um, I don't know. There's things I, like the BP advert. I remember um, Hendrix, Little Wing being in that I don't know I just remember that when I was when I was a kid as well and just being like who is this you know it's more a discovery on myself really I mean my dad had like eight tracks and stuff and he had fireball deep purple fireball on eight track which I've got his machine and all the eight tracks um Sabbath uh we sold our soul for rock and roll um yeah, just like out on John Yellow Brick Road, whatever with that one. But you know, there was just stuff that I I was exposed to. And bloody, don't get me started on tubular bells on a Sunday afternoon after a few oh. beers with my dad. Wasn't that? Wasn't, yeah, that, um, wasn't that Dennis? Like... What, wasn't that the famous serial killer Dennis Nielsen's favourite album? Oh, probably. Yeah, I should know I think this. So. I work, my day job is working on. Um, killer programs so i should know, I should know. oh right okay. well well there you go hey turns out i'm a pro yeah. as well um, mm-hmm. so um, yeah yeah you know um we've all got our unique sort of path to metal and how we find it and how it and how it never leaves us as well mm-hmm. um and it's always interesting to get people's you know people's story on on where they started but i've never heard i've never heard that lucas a dad quoted before um <laughs> um... Well, funny. Well, the thing is, but you know, not a lot of people know this. But between the ages of three and five, I actually couldn't hear. Um, I was waiting to have an operation, so it would be intermittently I would hear things. So we always have music on because my mum hopes that I would be able to hear. Yeah. So we had old grey whistle test on. um, Radio one was permanently on. and so, yeah, until I got my operation. So I used to say things backwards. It's all a bit bizarre, really. But, yeah, so I've come a long way. Um, I've got tinnitus, thanks to Creator and Leon. But, yeah, in one ear. But, um, yeah, I'm, you know, my hearing's fine. And, you know, despite all the metal over the years, um, it's still going strong. So, yeah, and I think that understanding of hearing it for the first time after a long time, I don't know. Maybe I just had a, a love, love at first sight, as they say, with um, music, really. So yeah, yeah. And understanding the riff, as I say, yeah. It, it's a, it's a, it's a funny thing, um, you know, when you when you first get into metal. And funnily enough, I've been going through going through some um, some real emotions a couple of weeks ago, and I'm sure you. I know, well, I know you're gonna. 
identify this because um, when this podcast goes out, there's going to be a little kind of 15 minute section, which I've already recorded. And I recorded it um, two days after seeing Slayer at Wembley Arena um, mm. because I've never had that experience before of these guys who've been there all my life. I've seen Slayer every two years since I was 17. And for them to all of a sudden be gone, it was just just really, really, yeah, it just kind of took the wind out of my sails. Um, it, it, I, I remember leaving and it was, as we were leaving the gig, it was like, it was like leaving a mass funeral. It was just, it was fucking bizarre. It was bizarre. kind of strange with Tom waving goodbye. Because I, I, through the grapevine, I've heard that he's the one that really is, is, done with it all to be honest um, oh yeah well he wanted he, he wanted to re- he would have retired in 2008 um if it wasn't for the financial crash he lost a load of money in it he's wanted mm. to retire for years because i've done a i've done a number of slayer specials on here with inverted commas experts but you know people like like joel mciver and um uh and and various people who've you know written about slayer and dx ferris and um yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think that was it. Was kind of weird, though, wasn't it? Because he was the one that hung around on stage the longest, mm. um, and he's the one that seemed to be taking it in more. And I, it just made me kind of feel like, right, he's he's the one who really wants to leave, but he's the one who's milking it. What do the other three know that we don't know? Yeah, it's quite. I don't know, but they're, they're going to be playing Hellfest. They've just been announced for Donington as well. I never announce it as the new festival name, but yeah. So um, maybe Donington would be a good fitting for my final viewing, as they were the first. That was the first time I saw them. Was it Donington? Oh, uh, right, 1995. Okay. Yeah, the I remember that. The monumental lineup that was Donington 1995. Uh, so yeah, I mean maybe that's that's the the final resting place for Slayer. But yeah. then there's Hellfest as well, and. You know how I feel about that festival, so I might, I might be seeing them <laughs> twice in the summer. But you know, they're, I think probably they're going to do this like Kiss are, you know, milk it like the cow that it is. Um, I heard that Kiss are going to go on for another three years, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just think like, well, look, ultimately, um, you know, I, I would, I would pay big money to see Kiss just fucking pack up tomorrow, um, <laughs> but. Um, Preferably never form in the first place. That's a bit harsh because we've got some decent band. They've they have inspired some decent bands apart from being the piss weak radio rock that they are. Um, I don't know though. I've got I'm, oh, I'm no. a massive Kiss fan. Oh like, no! Time. Yeah, it was yeah. all going well, so well. Though, I could just about squeeze a couple of tracks out of the eighties. <laughs> Creatures of Night, mate. The the drums on that are off the charts. But like, yeah. The 70s stuff, especially the early stuff, you know, it's really heavy. And it uh, it did influence, you know, people like Dimebag, you know. Um, Scott Ian. So, so, so many people. Every, Scott Ian, yeah, every yeah. Skid Row, oh, gee, it's endless. I was speaking to Brant Bjork the other day and he was t- chatting to me about Kiss. I didn't even bring the subject up. Do you know what I mean? Like, people just love it. Uh, Ministry, when I interviewed them, you know, they had these blow-ups of uh trump at the side all with kiss stuff all over. you know right. i don't know yeah. i think it's it's because of how they were put out to the world in the 70s you know they were seen they were put out for kids they were kids kids kiss dolls and well this is the thing like, one thing that you know one cartoons thing... and but this it is was it. like yeah. a you know animated thing and they nailed it on the on the merch front you well, know, they, so they much were, so that they've yeah. got their own casket now, which Dimebag was buried in. Yeah. They have their own kiss condoms, toilet paper. I mean, the guy's rolling. <laughs> I would definitely have some kiss toilet paper. Um, or, 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 as I li- or, or as I like to call it, a CD booklet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, look, they were way, way, way ahead of the game when it comes to merch. I mean, you look at how bands are now bringing out, you know, whiskies, beers, wines, mm. um, coffees, basically anything you can put a logo on because bands have literally become brands because you need to mm. stick your logo on something physical that you can actually sell so you can make some money. 
Yeah, because, you know, God forbid the days when albums used to sell or people didn't download them for free, you know. I mean, uh, in some ways, as a fan, it, a metal fan, you know, we get it good these days because bands have to tour all the time. I mean, Mastodon are coming through, again, the UK in January. So it's like they they were only here like a few months ago. Yeah. So it's just like bands are having to constantly tour that's how they're making their money these days. So for fans, it's great. But um, it also means, I think, that not necessarily you always get, like, the best product as far as an album goes. Like, it's a rush job, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, because if, um, if you're off the road, you are burning money, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's, I mean, you know, this is a very good point that a lot of people are making, which is that... It's it's meaning that basically you know the album tour cycle, um, yeah, bands can pretty much. I can see it where you're going to come off the road, go into the studio, <laughs> record the new album, get back out on the road for the new album. I mean, literally mm. come off the road and be back on it six nine months later with a new album out. Um, mm. uh, but yeah, look, it, unfortunately that is you know that's the way of the world, and um, it's just it's yeah, it's what we've all got to live with. But um, mm. but I know what you mean when you were saying earlier about um, about you know the amount of stuff that you get sent through the amount of albums. I had uh, Tim from Mass Movement on here um, last month, and he was saying exactly the same thing. He was saying it's just it it is almost impossible. He said, "Well, it is impossible to listen to everything." He said, "We just have to mm. we just basically have to comb through, and if there's something in there that sticks out, like oh, this member used to be in so and so." Or oh, this do you know what I mean? They need to look at to be drawn in to listen to something. There needs to be something extra. Um, yeah, because it's otherwise, the saturation you know, yeah. of it, you know. And and do music because it's your passion. Don't do it because you think you're going to make money out of it. And that's that's still to this day. I still meet like up and coming bands that think that they're going to get this mega deal. And then they're going to travel around the world. I mean, that that's like been and gone. And like in the early 80s, that, that idea was like, see ya, you know, um, you've got to really work it and work it hard. And I've had bands like message me going, oh, can you hook me up with like um, some labels? It's like, dude, you know, you have to do that on your own. I'm not just going to hand you everything. Do you know, I, I, is that harsh of me? No, 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 no. But I just felt like, come on, you know, you you have to find your path in this business, and it's a hard graft, you know. Whether it be doing, you know, your band doing the com- comedic comedic stuff or the radio show, it's all stuff that you've worked a damn sight hard for to get to. Yeah. So to just hand someone and go, oh yeah, there you go. There's all my contacts. Go on. I've only I've only like, you know been working at those contacts for like you know um but yeah so it's just i don't know i th- i'd probably sound really out i'm really brutal there um but yeah it is what it is well exactly no i mean i, I don't think you um uh i don't think you um i don't know i i, I don't think you're being harsh i think you you try to teach people a lesson which is things don't come to you you have to go and fucking get them or in the words of ACDC, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. The end. That's the true as a word is spoken. You know. Yeah. As cheesy as that sounds, but it's true. No, uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and um, and and you're right as well. It's not um, it's not a path to riches anymore. It's basically um, minimum wage, and you get to travel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, there's... you get to see lots of lots of freeways, um, all everywhere. That's that's it, and some service stations if you're lucky, and maybe you might have a shower somewhere on a month tour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's about that. But I've done a bit of TMing in my time. I've done a bit of um, you know promotion in my time. You know, I, I think I've hit all the avenues in music, but this is. The one that I feel most at home with is finding music and, and the radio show kind of gives me, it pushes me, propels me forward 
to continue to find new stuff, new music. And and if I do find a band that I like, I'll, I'll put them out there. And, you know, I'm not about to, like, disregard other people's top 10 list of 2018. But I put in there what I feel is right for me as as a as a listener of music, you know, and hope that some of my my albums that I choose, it will turn people on to stuff they've not heard before, you know. So, and I was happy to see that Decibel magazine had put Satan in their top 40 because that album is amazing, you know, for a, for a traditional new wave of British heavy metal band um, yeah. that have been going since the mid to late 70s to be hitting a, you know, a top 40 list with sleep and band and corrosion of conformity and stuff like that. It's, it's great. You know, it's made me proud, man. Proud, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, you're... And uh, I had them on the show a couple of weeks ago and one of the listeners was like, man, that sounds so good. Bought the album, it's going to see them next week in Camden. So like, you know, stuff like that is like, you're kind of promoting it. You know, it's all, it's all like family, isn't it really? Yeah, like I mean, swap tapes years ago. <laughs> well, I've 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 always felt it my job, um, just amongst my friends. I've always I've always felt like it was my job to, um, if I discovered a new album, you know, if I discovered a new band, I just had to play it to everybody. Do you know what I mean? It's just mm, like, mm. and I'm still the yeah, same. You've got to hear this riff, man. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm and I'm still the same now. You know, I'm still the same now. If I find something that um, that I like, you know, it, it's I'm I'm you know pushing it on the podcast. I'm telling telling all my mates, you know, and I'm always I'm always looking for the the next thing, the new thing. But I, it's it's weird. There's never been so much to choose from, and it's never been so hard to find because there is you know there's too much choice to be able to you know it, it's just made everything harder to discover new bands and new music. Mm. It's, it's yeah, you know, and you know, years ago you used to have like um, you'd have someone from a label go into shows to check out new bands. That that's that's the thing of the past these days. Well, now it's like... now it's just send us send us a few MP3s, send us your analytics on all your social media, um, mm. and um, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, yeah. But, um... I mean, I think the last band that really kind of was the end of, of say, that, that period was actually the darkness for me because they sold out the Astoria two nights off their own back, weren't yeah. signed to anyone. They might have had their grannies in there, next door's dog, you know, yeah. but they sold it out and they made so much noise that the labels had to listen, yeah. you know. They're like, holy shit! These guys, these guys have sold out the Astoria, the legendary Astoria. Yeah. So I think, and you know, when they came out, everyone thought they were a joke. But I, I remember listening to them on BBC um, Radio One. Joe Wiley was playing in them, and I was like, oh, thank God, someone's playing the guitar correctly. They're not ashamed to play a solo. It's amazing. And this was like two thousand. 2001 I was at uni at the time and yeah I just remember hearing them and just being like yes it's back so die you... new metal die <laughs> <laughs> so so you were at uni in 2001 2000 yeah right yeah you're a lot younger than me <laughs> yeah but I I went to uni late I went to uni at like 21 so yeah it's fine but I just remember most of my um, uni check going on albums. <laughs> you know, as you do. Just like, oh, what's coming out this week? I remember Stone Sour coming out and being quite excited about them. Um, again, because they were quite happy to uh, throw out riffs that were good. Um, but it was a weird time. It was, it was like, and the stoner scene didn't really hit my radar you know, and I know that that was coming up around that time and it didn't really hit my, my radar, not till later on, actually. Um, you know, like Caius and Fu Manchu and Nebula and stuff like that, you know, Sleep and 
on fire and things was is that was like coming through and I it didn't it didn't register with me I, I felt like 1998 when Thrash was like on its way out and that whole you know and Metallica put out those abominations um a couple of them are all right on their tracks um load and reload but yeah it just started to teeter out and then Megadeth got a bit like put out risk I was like what is this um, and it just all started to kind of fade away and you were left clutching at straws in the hope that, you know, down were around about that time. And yeah, it was, it was a strange time for music for sure, for sure. Although I did get to see Kiss play at Donington, original lineup, just saying. I knew you'd uh, like that. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> what, what can I say? Are you lucky thing? Um, I, I've never also been so jealous. It was the end of Sepultura as well because, you know, Max didn't turn up to that show at Donington. And oh, well, that, that yeah, yeah. It was... Also, it teetered out. You know what I mean? Like all these like mega bands that you were, Anthrax, you know, even like Creator and stuff like that were all starting to get like industrial in some way. Like they were ch- everyone was changing their sounds to accommodate the climate of music at that point. So, I don't know, it was just a strange period of metal, shall I say. Uh, it was. I mean, you had you had cre- that was the that was when Creator brought out Renewal and all of that. Um mm. and um it was it was a bizarre it was a bizarre time because for the first time ever you felt like there were there were metal bands that were that were chasing other styles to try to mm. try and stay relevant. And the point of metal has always been that it's metal, hence it's relevant to people who like metal. Mm. Um, mm. and um, it it just yeah I mean then we went through that whole phase where everybody had to have a DJ or a or a or a slap bass uh be- the slap bass break or you know everyone was starting to chuck in a little bit of a little bit of funk um yeah. and shit like that mm. and it, and yeah there were the the wilderness years yeah although <laughs> you know I'm gonna come back to you know the start of the conversation really in Slayer because they kind of tended to not change any of their sound. I mean, they they brought out Undisputed Attitude, which was a, a, a far different to Divine Intervention, um, you know, putting out a covers album. But, you know, they can't, They still kept it true, you know, I think. Oh, absolutely. They never really changed. I mean, there's some little bits here and there that you're like, oh, that sounds quite to the period of time, but... Well, the, you know the big one. Is, the big one is Di- Diablos and Musica. That's the one that mm. seems to be where people are like, "Oh, you know, they they that was Slayer trying to do new metal," which I think is absolute bollocks. Um, mm. And you know, all you need to do is go back and listen to that um, that album, and you realise that yeah, that that opinion is bollocks because it's it's a great album, um, and. Um, uh, of, of which Hanneman gets uh, 11 songwriting credits on 13 songs. So all the people who are going on about Hanneman, you know, wrote all the best stuff and then slag off Diablos and Musica is a bit weird because that was very much a Hanneman album because it was followed by God Hates Us All, which was very much a Kerry King album. Mm. Um, and um, But how how good was Slayer, though, mate? How good? I mean, I managed to... I had a standing ticket... And uh, I managed yeah. to blag um, up in the seats because, you know, being a short ass that I am, well, I'm not that short, but, you know, there, there's always a tall guy that stands in front of me. Tell me about it. He looks around at me, me and he goes, it. oh, you don't need to see, do you? You're a girl. Yeah. That's, that's the usual thing. And I'm just like, you utter wanker. So I end up, like, having to shimmy around. And anyway, I bumped into Adam Sagir, and he's like, I've got a spare. I was like, yes, mate. Best moment ever was getting up there. And then I was stood there, although I had this um, heavy metal comedian stood in front of me. Oh, um, right. It was just weakening, no end. Anyway, we won't, we won't, we were digress. But it was great. It was great to be that high up, to be able to see everything, all of them on stage, all the flames, those things at the back of the Slayer things. I want one of those for my house. So anyone that's on that tour that wants to donate, thank you very much. I would very much appreciate one of those. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 
<clears throat> whole the whole thing, the set, the set list alone, they nailed it on every part. You know, I would have liked to have heard more divine intervention tracks, but you know, you can't have everything. But they played a good portion of every every part of their career. Yeah. Um and and some early stuff, you know, and it was good to hear hear the early stuff as well. So oh, yeah, yeah, I was just beaming the whole time, head banging, beaming you know, drinking, you know, it was just the best times ever, you know. Well, I, I, I was a happy bunny for I, sure that night. I know. And obituary nailed it, you know, and seeing obituary on that, on that stage, you know, and they, they killed it up there. I love that band. Um, so, yeah, they it, it, it all was just great. And um, don't, never say never. Go and see them at Download. Don't, don't let that be the last one. Yeah, I, well, we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, but I, I mean, I, I, I had the same experience. I am a short ass, and um, so I did spend a lot of my time just basically kind of bobbing about, you know, seeing between shoulders and shit like that. Um, but uh, it, yeah, I mean, it was just phenomenal. And when they when they went into Black Magic, um, yeah. uh, that yeah. was just because that's the that's the song that got me into Slayer. Um, so when that happened, I was just amazed. It was just fucking awesome. Um, actually, I got Slayer handed to me on a mixtape, so it had it had bits of like had skeletons of society on it. It had I don't know. It just had bits from seasons. Um, bits from Halloween, like just a couple of tracks on each. But that, and then on the on the A side, I think was like a mix of Metallica. There was like Ride the Lightning on there, a bit of Master of Puppets, and a bit of Injustice, you know. But yeah, I mean, Post Mortem is my favourite Slayer track of all time. So they played that. Of course, I was losing my mind over that. Um, but yeah, it was it was great. The whole thing, Chemical Warfare, near to the end. Come on, man. I know. Uh, right. I, I, I mean, right. I can't remember the last time I played Chemical Warfare. Probably the last time I heard it was the last time I saw Slayer. Um, before that, and um, and it, yeah, it was just fucking awesome. Yeah, I've got the set list up in front of me now. But yeah, just I don't know. They, they just killed. They killed it. All of it. It was. It was good times. Good time. Mandatory. Oh yeah, just all of it. All of it was good. I'm sick. Yeah, my face is hurt. And I'm smiling right now. <laughs> I know. Well, funnily enough, I was I was looking at your Facebook earlier, um, and uh, and because that, that's how I know you were at Wembley. I even I even watched a couple of your vids as well. <laughs> and it, like that bitch, she can see everything. <laughs> I know. How Jesus, she's tall. <laughs> um, how's she How's she seen all the way up there? Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was just it was incredible, and. Um, it's funny one of the one of the bands one of the uh, uh, one of my biggest influences and you know biggest loves I mean I would say probably my favorite metal album of all time is probably Rain and Blood and mm. um uh I've never met any of them and and that's just really weird because I've I've pretty much met everybody that I want to meet um uh, but I never I never met any of any of Slayer and it was just it's, I don't know. It's just bizarre, really. You best get press for download, then, mate. Come on, sort it out. <laughs> well, you know, if you can, if you can sort me out some guest lists. <laughs> just, get, just do press. Why don't you do press? Interview Slayer. One, you've got to try and not wet yourself while you're doing it and be oh. a total fanboy. Well, actually, no. But also, you yeah. get to meet them, well, and I'm that... sure, I'm sure that. You speak to Nuclear Blast, they'll sort it out for you. I'll, I, I tell a lie. I interviewed last time when they came around with Anthrax and played Brixton Academy. I, inter- I interviewed Gary because um, obviously he, you know, I toured with Exodus back in the day. So it was, uh, but Gary was the only member I, I've met, and I've obviously, you know, I've met him several times, toured with him. So um, yeah, that doesn't really count. I know, and a lot of people that didn't go to Slayer were like, "Well, it's only two. It's only two of the four. And I was like, "Well, I know, but it's still, you know, I've seen all of the all of the modes of Slayer, shall we say? And um, you know, yeah, Jeff Hanneman's not there, and I think Gary Holt is doing a good job. 
Um, it's a shame, shame about David Lombardo, um, but I think he's absolutely killing it with suicidal tendencies right now. And also Dead Cross, um, which I got to see at Hellfest and also suicidal at, um, in Melbourne at Download Festival there. So, yeah, I mean, he seems content. And, you know, he's he's a really good drummer, so he's doing... Testament or, or Exodus or one of the bands that he, he's normally playing in, so one of the Bay Area ones. So you know, it'll 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 work out. And Tom will be on his ranch, you know, feeding his animals and Kerry well playing with you know the chains round his waist. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, so no. It's um, I, I look. I mean, I, I'm kind of tempted uh, to go and see um, to go and see. Don't say kinda. Just do it. <laughs> Come on, you're a Slayer fan. Um, Come on. I I am. I am. But it's just kind of like uh, I don't know. There's it, it, it festivals. There's a there's a whole load of things to um, uh, you know, to 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 get organised around. Um, I don't know. It, I'll I'll take it under advisement. You'll regret it. They might even do some Uber Uber special show. Remember, do you remember the Rain in Blood when they did the anniversary tour and they actually had Rain in Blood coming from the the um, top of the stage? They, Best um, thing I've ever seen. I saw it twice. Um, I saw it. I saw two shows virt- virtually exactly a year apart. At the Astoria. Nice. Oh, mate. I think I might have seen I can't remember where I saw that tour, but, yeah, I just remember it being like, oh, my God, that's amazing, you know. But, yeah. Uh, it, it was just, it was brilliant. Although I don't think, we didn't have the rain in blood. We didn't have actually have the raining blood. Um, but, um, but it was still awesome. I mean, you know, getting to see rain in blood all the way through was just fucking insane it to really be honest I, the the thing that came close that brought me to tears was seeing Master of Puppets played start to finish I think it might have been at Donington oh my god it was so good yeah I think uh, there were tears especially when they played Orion I'd love to have seen like, that <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd love to have seen that I really would hmm Mm, but yeah, yeah, I, I'm, yeah. So sorely missed, sorely missed. Um, mm. But uh, it, I, I mean, yeah, it's just like I said, it's just a, a weird feeling that the that they're not going to be around, you know, every two years like they always have been. It's just really odd. Yeah, but you can say that about Motorhead. I mean, it's religious. Yeah, but if I was a Motorhead every fan, every single October, November, Motorhead play every single year. I'd see the same, you know, when I was working in, in the crowbar, I'd see the same Germans come through every year, like, we're going to see Motorhead tonight. It's like, yeah, man. Like, you know, every year, religiously. And then, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, time goes on, doesn't it? You know, and there's, and there's like we said, there's a saturation of, of bands coming through. Um, we just got to hope for the Mastodons and the Ghosts um, and well, hope that they're out there and a new band who you know hit my radar before it all blew up for them Power Trip as well you know it's like they are out there I, well, I, 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 I totally agree, I totally agree with all of you um, with all of all of what you said there um, apart from Ghost obviously um, but um, yeah I mean it, it, you, you do have to hold out the hope that these bands are going to that you know bands are going to come through and replace you know the classics as it were um and uh, and i think you know uh, some of us thought you know machine ed were going to be one of those bands um and everything seems to have gone a bit wonky there um can i just throw out there violence the end oh yeah well you know absolutely i got um i got arrest i got arrested on the way to buy their second album 
<laughs> I, sorry, arrested is a little bit strong. Me and me and a mate, uh, we'd been we'd been I'd been ringing Red Rhino Records in York every day, waiting for it to come in. And me and my mate were driving back from uh, Newcastle, and we called in at a service station, got on a payphone, and I rang them, um, and they said, "Yes, it's in. We've got them." So I was like, so I told him, and we we hung up the the, the phone ran to the car in the car park and a policeman was sat there in his car watching us. We ran to the car, jumped in, went off onto the motorway and got pulled over on the motorway and he wanted to know what we were up to. Why? Because like, he thought you were st- he just, you had stolen the car or well, something? Well, he, he just thought... Well, it just looked, you at- well he, he, quite, he quite rightly thought it looked a bit fucking dodgy. Um, <laughs> so... Um, so they got uh, drugs. Well, it was literally. It, it was literally. Uh, well, you're not going to believe this. Uh, um, we're 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 on our way to get. you. Of course, I'm going to believe believe it. Come on. <laughs> well, we're going like right. Okay, mate. Uh, well, basically, we're on. <laughs> we're we're rushing to uh, to get to a record shop to buy a new album by a band called Violence. And he just looked at us and he was like, "Really." I was like, yeah, he goes, you must really like music. I was like, yeah, yeah. But, you know, this is this this album is going to be legendary. And he was like, all right, well, you know, drive safely. And we're like, yeah, cheers, mate. Thanks for slowing us down. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, it, and, yeah, I mean, pff, violence, what a band. What a band. Yeah, but, you know, everyone's like boo-hooing about Machine Head. Hello. You know, they were in a, like, a really, really good band before they were in Machine Head called Violence. And, um, yeah, and I just, and, you know, I've thrown it out on loads of people's walls on Facebook. And they're just like, who? I know. Exactly. Walk away. Walk away. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah you know, it's like it. And Machine Head have gone through their, their moments as well. I mean, and I think between you and I, their latest album is really like the straw that broke the camel's back, I think. What the the most you know. recent album? Yeah, the the last the last one yeah. that was put out. See, I don't even know the name of it. I just know that I gave it like ten minutes of my time, and I was out. Well, I, um, mu- I must admit, I, I I am on record on the podcast as saying um, I don't mind it. I um, I quite like it. Um, I I mean, I chucked about five songs off it to create to create a, a version that didn't have some horrendous songs on. But um, I didn't listen to it for ages, and I listened to it again the other day, and I was just like, "Oh dear," you know. It, I mean, it's, it is virtually career suicide. Um, mm. I don't know. I, yeah, don't... especially when you listen, you know, they they have gone through trends. I say that with with you know brackets. Um, but you know, you have to go back to like burn my eyes. I mean, when that came out. It's just monumental. They went out on tour with Slayer. Um, I saw them open up uh, Donington '95. You know they owned it. Well, I was um, you know, I they... was I was in Metalhead in when it was still in Camden. I was in Metalhead in Camden. Mm. Um, I went down there specifically to pick up Burn My Eyes the day it came out because I was like, you know, I was well aware that Rob Flynn of Violence had a new band coming out. Um, and Chris Contos was on drums. Who used to be in Attitude, Attitude Adjustment. So I was like, "Fucking yeah. hell, I've got it." I, I bought two copies. I bought one for me and one for my best mate, who was a huge Violence fan because I knew he'd like it. The same best mate who, you know, whose car we got pulled over in on the way to get oppressing <laughs> the masses. So, um, so I just bought, I just bought one, and uh, I, sorry, I just bought two and went home. And I was staying with him um, at the time, so I just gave him it. So like that, that's that's my rent. And we just sat. We sat there. And neither of us had listened to it. He stuck it on playing, and we were just like, "Fucking hell, this is great!" Mm. And I saw him at the Astoria for the Christmas show that year when they got virtually the whole crowd on stage at the end. Um, yeah. Um, and it was awesome. And they they supported Slayer on a tour as well. I remember seeing him at Brixton supporting Slayer. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I think uh, that was when that's when Slayer had just brought out. Um, they were on their promotional tour for Divine Intervention, I think, and yes, uh, yeah. or the start of and Burn My Eyes was already out, and so it was a definitely a Roadrunner promotional tour for both bands. But yeah, I mean, you know, 
they killed it at, um, at Donington. And, you you know, there were so many kids with, like, machine head, neon yellow machine head signs on it. Or, or, you know, you'd look to the stage and you could just see them all on the backs of these kids and stuff. Yeah, it was it was a great time for music, for sure, when they came out. But, you know, they've gone through the trends over the years and, and um, I don't know, I just... It's it's just a bit tiring, you know, well, and I think their last album is like, like I said. Well, I think I think it's basically the that broke the camel's back. Well, I think all all that metal fans are looking for is is like is honesty and and for bands mm. to be genuine, and it just smacks of a little bit a little bit disingenuous the fact these shifts. But also, I think I think you're right. I think when you when you read about you know uh, Dave Dave McLean and um, um, Oh fucking hell! I always blank on his name. It was really annoying. He was also in Violence, rhythm guitarist. Yeah, um, yeah, um, oh, yeah. Really annoying. I, I never. I know who you're on about. Okay. I'm, I'm just apologies. Uh, apologies to listeners. Phil, that's Devil. it. There Phil Devil. Get it in the end. Yes, nice one. And I think those two, you know, announcing they're leaving, and then and then and then Rob saying, you know, oh, you know, I think I might have, you know just sort of try to hold things too close. And, all. and I think, yeah, what's happened here is that um, he's been, he's been very, um, uh, oh, what's the word? Um, he's been, he's, he's been, he's been very um, concentrated on writing the music himself and not letting anybody, you know, not giving anybody else um, their due credit as a musician and allowing them to contribute. And I think he's been like, no, look, you know, I know what's best for Machine Head all along the way. And I think they've gone along with it. And then you put out a turkey and they've gone, well, you know what? This is bullshit. I don't think that helped in what's, what's occurred to Machine Heads, really. But that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. I could be talking out of my ass, but that's, you know, that's well, how I feel about that. Don't worry, mate. Really? This po- this podcast is called Talking Bollocks, and I spend most of my time <laughs> talking out of my ass. So, um, as as well as talking bollocks. But by the way, I've I've just remembered I'm doing a live podcast in um, in Camden in January. You'll ha- please do come along. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll come along. I, I might be off the booze, but I'll come along. <laughs> oh, well, I, well, I'll I'll definitely be off the booze because I'll be performing. My, I'll be performing. Love can't possibly be drunk. Um, but uh, yeah, no, you'll have to come along because it's um, it's going to be a cracker. Um, I'm I'm spending all my time plugging it on social media at the moment. And by wit, by I've got of course you give give your show a plug as well for goodness sake. Oh yeah, the um, I, I, you know me. Um, <laughs> is, <laughs> uh, yeah, Barnet's brutal brunch um, every Wednesday eight pm live, always live uh, interview every week. Um, yeah, get involved. I play everything from thrash, doom, a little bit of black, loads of death, uh, stoner. Yeah, you know, total rock. Get involved. It's good times. Good times over there. But, so that's where where, my, where I'm at. And yeah, ninth year, man, this month. Really? Where the time go? You know, wow. I've been remote live for so long now that um, yeah, it's been it's been good. Good for sure. So um, uh, you've you've um, I, I've seen you. You've got snake. You had snake from Voivod on, didn't you? Mm, that was good fun. Oh, yeah, man, yeah, he was yeah. he was oh such a lovely soul, man. Yeah, we got on like a house on fire. Um, also, our favourite Kiss album is Dressed to Kill. So yeah, we were we were singing oh, that to each no. other. But yeah, man, we we're just um, I don't know. Yeah, you know, you you have interviews with with people and. Sometimes they're going through the motions and sometimes it's actually an interaction of two people having a conversation like us two now. Yeah. And um, and sometimes they talk at you because they know what they need to be saying in an interview and sometimes they yeah. actually, the questions you ask are quite thought-provoking and instigate good responses. So, yeah, you know. It's uh, it was a good interview. Yeah, it was great. And and you know they were on their anniversary tour as well, and nailing it. The new guys in the band are like, you know they couldn't 
not sing their praises and obviously yeah. you know the drummers in other bands as well and and you know i spoke to him about doing the album with dave grohl and um yeah. you know how that all came about and yeah just you know probot and stuff and just yeah just seeing a different side of dave grohl and and you know some people loathe him you know he's like marmite but you know i've i've worked a bar with him i've hung out with him and he's always been a good lad you know so well he's, kudos um, to him he's... and for for keeping music alive and doing what he can for for our genre you oh, know absolutely. heavy metal absolutely i mean i th- i i you know i think I, I love the guy i mean he's on he's on uh descendants documentary going on about how brilliant that uh, they are so as far as i'm concerned that's you know the, the man can do no wrong but um no i mean uh you know whenever you see me in, seeing him interviewed or you see like this the stuff they get up to and it's just and also the fact that what you know what a lot of people don't realize is um the foo fighters um uh have have never ever signed a record deal they own, they set their own label up straight away um and the label that you see the album coming out on is purely distribution purposes they own all of their they own all of their masters they own all of their back catalog all of their distribution deals are only for maximum 3 albums um i mean they it's a, it's a, an absolute complete punk setup um mm. uh, it, you know it is it's literally like the biggest diy band in the world um and uh, now i've i i, I mean a, a bit like and I, i'm 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 kind of I, I i know where you're coming from on on this one right i absolutely love dave grohl i cannot stand the food Fighters. well not i can't stand the Foo fighters but i get dragged in every album there's one song and you just think oh that's good mm. And then you, yeah. and then the album is oh that's right no it is more faceless just uh, middle of the road half punk half pop I don't know I think they uh, a lot of people will say that about them and um, you know my husband and I listened to them a lot and when I saw them at uh, when they played the O2 I I cried like a baby because for me there were so many memories that I'd had with my husband you know, of us going on road trips yeah. in California, you know, throughout Europe and, and, um, and they're like songs that you remember and, you know, perfect light, eh, you know, the new one, like you're so loudly in my life at the moment. So it's the hard times and you want a little bit of light, a bit of happiness, you know, that middle of the road, as you say, but you know, Dire Straits is middle of the road, but yet there's songs that he's put out there that you just go, man, you know, you listen to Salt and to Swing. I mean, come on. That's, <laughs> that was like one of the biggest sellers of all time. And and there's tracks on there that, that keep it, you know, you hear and you're just, oh, it's just unbelievable, you know, the guitar and everything. So I don't know. I think they just nail it. You know what I mean? And they they've got good hearts and, yeah, all right, they're a bit commercial, but so are Queen of the Stone Age, you know. Yeah, I just... Do I think uh, the... that they hold as much presence as Foo Fighters? Hell no. I think Foo Fighters are way bigger than Queens of the Stone Age, you know? Yeah, I just it, that, there's just something about the Foo Fighters that have never really, that has never really got, got me. And funnily enough, moving on, I've got the exact same issue with Lamb of God. Randy Bly, who I really like as an interview, and I really like his photography, but his vocals suck, <laughs> and and his band's pretty average, and it's it's kind of like oh you know, I really I really really want to like you you know, um, I mean I, I I hung around for four or five songs on uh, at the Slayer show, and I was just like do you know what I'm just not getting this, I'm really not. So for me, you know, and I'm on the same par as you, and I think it's because they were always thrown in with that new metal thing, you know, um, and I don't know, I think in in some ways, like Slipknot, for me, I still am a bit like some of the albums are good, some of them are like, oh. But then, you know, you look at the pit, 
and I looked down and it, it's going nuts. Um, I met, I randomly met some people in the TGI Fridays um, just before the show because God forbid you pay the prices of uh, Wembley um, Arena yeah. for a beer. But um, yeah, so I went and just randomly met these guys and he was from Hampshire so obviously the Shire have to have to chat to the Shire um, <laughs> and uh, yeah he we were like hanging out just you know it's how it rolls when you're single these days and um, and anyway yeah he was like oh please come in for Lama God I was like oh my god I just don't want to do this. and you know to appease because he, they were so excited and I wanted to see them having a good time and I stayed in there, and he, you know, everyone was like protecting me. But the surgeon, you know, crowd yeah. surge and stuff. I was like, right. And I think it was about five songs before I was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. I'm, I'm like going to get some Lagunitas IPA and end this this hell right now. <laughs> well, f- funnily enough, I went and I, I went and um, uh, sat down next to next to the, um, the merch out front, and um, and a friend of mine who I'd bumped into on the way into the gig um, was doing the same thing. So um, so we went and got a pint and I got to sit, and he's a like, childhood friend who I've only seen a, a few times over the last few years. So it's great to sit down and, and, you know, I could not have enjoyed Lamb of God more than being sat with my childhood friend, having a beer, uh, catching up with each other. So, um, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, thanks to Lamb of God, I would never have had that experience if, it, if they hadn't been so goddamn average. But... Um, you you yeah. always got to have a beer break or a or a food break on a bill, you know, and that that's what they delivered for us. Yeah, you know? absolutely. <laughs> yeah. They, they were the they were the I interval. Anthrax actually um, properly delivered the goods. Got to say. Yeah, poor Joe. Poor so Joey. Uh, poor Joey was struggling. He was obviously. Um, uh, he, yeah, he's, he, his voice wasn't uh, wasn't quite there, but he but he soldiered on. And uh, but I I I have to say it. I say it every time. Why the fuck are Anthrax playing two cover versions in a nine-song set? It makes no fucking sense. It's insane. Mm. Got the time? It's, yeah, whatever. There's no need to play it. And as for antisocial, I could, I could, I could quite happily never hear that again ever <laughs> until I die. Um, I mean, if you take those two songs out of the set, you could have had something really cool off Persistence of Time on there, or. You could have had, you could have had, you know, you could have had more. I would have liked to have heard Medusa. Can I throw that out there? I think uh, that track's amazing. Do you know what? Oh, Medusa, she's staring at you. Medusa with her eyes. Yeah. What else is she going (laughs) to stare at you with? (laughs) Give her that riff. Come on. Oh yeah, no, Uh, no, it's it is it is legendary. It is legendary. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, uh, come on, the lyrics, but you know, it's either one or the other these days. It's never both. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. It's that. It's that. Well, you'll j- just have to wait till our album comes out, then, won't you? And you'll be going, "Oh my god, oh, it's there you both. go, there you go." That, <laughs> yeah, throw it over, mate. I'll, I'll bang it out for you. No, tr- no troubles. No definitely, troubles at all. Definitely, definitely. Well, look, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. I really, I really, really enjoyed talking to you as always. Um, and um, uh, I'll let you know when this is. I'll let you know when this goes up. I think this is probably going to go up uh, this month, so it'll come out at the end of November. Um, and I'll um, do. I do. I link. I don't want to link your Facebook page. Um, what's the best way to link you in? Well, you can do. You can do the Barnet's Brutal Bunch page. Yeah, whatever oh, is that, you that, want that, to do. Uh, cool. Yeah, no, like no. You, if. You, if you want to do that, no, you know, I mean, link I... it up. I'm on Twitter as well. I'm on oh, brilliant. Uh, Instagram. So, Great. you know, just... Hook it up, love. Will you know do. Good. Will do. No, I, yeah. No, I wanted. I, I didn't realise you had a brittle bunch um, Facebook page because I, you know, you mm. said you'd gone on kind of like secret agent with your uh, with your other profile. So I was like, right, okay, that. But that's great. I know what I know what I'm doing now. Yeah, it's all there. But yeah, yeah, you know, um, one thing I wanted to bring up earlier was um, when you said about them doing their own thing, uh, Foo Fighters. I believe UB40 was the first band of my knowledge that did their own thing and put out their own records, um, which blows my mind that those Grammys were, you know, on the dole and they were like, no, we're going to do it ourselves, man. And they literally caned it. 
right, red, red wine, all that jazz. And they're yeah. still they're still caning it. Where all the money went, who knows? But um, yeah, but they're st- yeah. and they're still caning it. They're still going. They've Let's actually see. fractured. Um, the two brothers are like in some kind of hate war with one another. So there's half of the band in one side and half in the other. Um, it's all a bit bizarre, really. It's just a shame, you know. BBC documentaries, you've got to love them. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was. I watched it, and I was, you know, it's a part of my youth and. Like I said right at the beginning, like my uncle and the whole two-tone punk crossover scene. Uh, it's probably why I've got a bit of love for hardcore, uh, you know, New York style um, comes out of that. But yeah, you know, horses for courses. It's, it's, we we love what we love. And, I, you know, there are loads of bands out there. And who am I to say what's good and what's bad? Um, it's like I said before, it's subjective. So well, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, but but that but that's why when it comes to doing a radio show, all you can do is play the stuff that you like that chimes with you, because ultimately, you know, that's that's what it's all about. It's just spreading the word of stuff that you love. Mm, mm. And yeah. and hoping that you know that excitement that you have about showing someone like you said earlier oh yeah you know you, get, you hear this album you're like oh man so and so would love this album and then you run to them and you're like put this on listen to this track here and and having that excitement and doing that every week you know yeah. that's why I'm still doing it after nine years you know that's that's why I'm still at Total Rock well, and you know why I've not going, gone to other places and you know, because they give you the freedom and, you know, to do what you want. And, you know, I've had other other DJs that are on there now going, oh, I am hook us up. You know, Dom Lawson, for instance, and he's still doing his show and he loves it, you know. And, yeah, come on board, man. Get involved. Love to. Love to. Um well, look, that's a separate conversation, and let let's let, <laughs> that, let's let's have that another, another time. But I'm bang up for that. Um, but look, Emma, thank you so much for coming on. Really do appreciate it. Um, and um, it'd be good to it'd be good to um, catch up. Let me know next time you're in London. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We'll catch a beer or something. And um, yeah, give me let me know like the dates and everything for your um, live podcast, and I'll I'll I will. get involved and. Bring the glam. And, well, I, well, uh, also, yeah, we're still, well, we're also, well, also, well, as well as a live podcast, um, uh, December the twenty second, Saturday. More than happy to put you on the guest list if you want to come and see us and Akakoka uh, do a Christmas show at the Underworld in Camden. Oh, that sounds rad. Well, twenty second. Yeah, just let me know. Uh, guest list is available for your good self plus one. Obviously. Okay, well, the plus one might be might be an if. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll. That's what I say. Balls to them. Um, but yeah, no, that sounds rad, mate. Cool. I'll be one up for that. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, I'll hold you to that. Awesome. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll hold you to that more like it because you know. <laughs> All right. Well, we know I... it rolls the underworld. No, you've got less guesses now. We've managed to sell more tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't you worry. There'll be plenty of tickets, but um, <laughs> I'll. Oh, um, bless you. I'll, no, I think I'll it's going to be out. good. And make sure you send me over your new stuff as well, and all your deets when it's out. Who's it going through? Blah blah. As soon as jazz. as soon as I actually know any of that, I will I will send those details. But uh, uh, yeah, at the moment, the answer <laughs> to that all of those questions is not a fucking clue. <laughs> <laughs> All I can tell you with the fucking song titles, that's it. Song titles and album title. Other than that, yeah, it, it, the hard work begins in January when we start shopping a fucking finished, mastered album. Um, but uh, there's plenty of people to talk to, so I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. There's a few to steer away from as well, but we'll go we'll go into that after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah, you'll you'll work it out. I'm sure you will. Oh, we've got, I've got, I've got the best thing about having been around in this business many, many years ago, and then been back in it for a few years as well. Is that she's got so many contacts that um, and people uh, who who remember the band. Um, it's just it, you know, it, it's just awesome, basically. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 going to keep it going. 
Oh? Aha. Ah, yeah, oh, mate. I, look, uh, oh, here we go at last. Um. Oh, fuck it up. Right, I'm going to call you back in a sec. Hang on. Ah, oh, fuck me. What an absolute fucking mess that is. Jesus Christ. Right. Get this bloody thing working again. Sorry about this, guys. And yeah, I, I could have edited all of this out. Um, but I'm going to keep it in. What the fuck? Why not, eh? Right. Um, <laughs> there we go. That's the noise. So, Skype. Bring Emma back. See, there we go. Are you ready for me now? <laughs> I'm, all, I'm. Are all, you ready for me now? <laughs> I'm. I'm, all, I'm always ready for you, my love. Um, um, yeah. So you 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 went off, and I don't know what happened, but right. here we are. We're back. We're back. So back you, in. So you were you were, you you were saying that maybe edit the bit about Rob Flynn out because you feel bad about that now. <laughs> well, you know, like it's all right. I, know, I went to his birthday party. He's he's all all right, lad. You know, I used to. I remember um, the Exodus show, and it actually it was a week after Will passed away, and it was pretty brutal. But I was my friend Tom. Um, who now plays in Carcass was is play was playing with Pounder that night and is going to be playing uh, with Pounder at the Decibel um, Magazine Festival, which is in two weeks in LA. Anyway, yeah, and I was determined to go because I wanted to see, um, yeah, I just wanted to see like the energy of the crowd. And I remember being backstage and you know Rob Jukes came out and it was just a massive Exodus party. And Rob was there and he, like, you know, gave me a nod because he'd remembered me and stuff. And, you know, so I, fa I feel a bit bad. But, you know, like we said, don't air your laundry out in public. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, I mean, to be honest, don't, don't, don't worry. He's, he's not going to hear it. <laughs> I know, so... but you just, I don't like upsetting or offending anyone. It's, it's not my not my forte. Although I am pretty brutal in person, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I well I have heard the that. Airways, yeah. darling, it's always professional. <laughs> well, yeah, you you well you've been there you've been there the height of uh, professional on this uh, on this podcast. If, if only if only I could have matched it. Um <laughs> by uh, by not have by by all, not having all of the fucking sound drop out. Um anyway, mate, look, let's ro let's um let's tie yeah. it up there and I will um I'll uh, I'll go over this and start chopping bits out. <laughs> Oh God, it's going to be yeah, so it's going to be a nightmare now. Eh? Don't don't um, worry, but... don't worry. All right, mate. Well, look, um, have a good one. I will. I'll send you the. I'll send you a uh, a poster of the of the gig. Uh, put it in your diary. Get in touch close to the time. All right. Yeah, nice one, mate. Yeah. Okay. And um, I'll post it out on all my social things and give you some noise, you know, because. Got to, got to keep the uh, British metal scene alive. That's the most um, kind of you, my dear. Most kind. Mm. Um, thank Anytime. you very much. For, thank you very much for your time, mate. Awesome to speak to you. Yeah, you too, darling. And uh, yeah, get me get me that album details, man. I will. Don't worry. <laughs> Just got to finish it. All right, babe. So okay. I'll catch you soon, then. Yeah, you take care. See you, darling. See Bye. ya. Bye -bye. Bye bye. Bye. And that was my chat with Emma Barnett. So um, I hope you all enjoyed that. I mean, I really, really enjoyed doing that. Um, we had we had a really, really well. You you know because we had a, a, a right old chat. And um, yeah, she's going to come down to the Acid Rain show hopefully. So um, and then she'll do an interview with me, and then hopefully I can get a copy of that, and I'll put that on Patreon. Patreon. Or, um, but you'd get along, have a listen to the show. It's really cool. She has just about everybody on there. Um, I don't know how she gets the interview she does, but she. I, I think I, basically, I think radio shows are a lot more respected than podcasts. That's. I'm not. I'm not. You know. I'm not saying that. You know. She. She's getting the interviews off her. You know. Off her own skills. Off her own back. Um, 
um, uh, uh, yeah, there's I, I'm basically I've tried to some interviews I've tried to get some PR companies I work with who are just like no, no to podcasts, full stop. So, um, but anyway, um, I've kind of gone off on a tangent there. Didn't mean to belittle um, Emma's radio show at all. Well, I can't because she gets guests on that I could only dream of. So there you go. Um, it's a really, really cool show. Um, check it out her her passion for metal is obvious you can hear it right there and um you know that's the kind of people that are going to keep this scene going of ours not that uh, there's any danger of it dying out that's for sure not as some people seem to think but there you go um so there was one last story that i wanted to um i, I, I wanted to talk about and that one and now some of you may know that you may know about this because it's 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 definitely become uh, a bit of a thing and being shared all over social media uh, media media um, and that's that's the uh, the band the LA band Threaten. Um, uh, now it, it's you know Threaten, but Threaten. Hey, get it? Um, now this is the original. The, the, this is the. I'm, I'm going to read you this story. Uh, it, it's it's just just sit back, right? Talking up your own band a little to make it appear that you're more popular than you are is write a passage for young acts and old ones. We do it all the time. We've heard of plenty of bands that um, they've exaggerated sales or live show numbers to land a gig or two or talk themselves up to a national media for pre- some press attention. It comes with the territory. It's usually harmless. But the Los Angeles band Threaten have taken the idea to a level previously thought unimaginable. The band was able to book an entire tour of Europe despite having no fan base whatsoever and it's all in the process of crashing down around them. To do it, the band's frontman and leader, Gerard Threaten, or Gerard Threaten, get it, eh? Posed as a non-existent booking agent, promoter, to land the gigs, used faked live footage of already packed shows in LA, bought Facebook likes, event RSVPs and YouTube views, and lied about ticket sales numbers to swindle venue owners and talent buyers into taking their shows. Post started making the rounds on social media when the when the tour kicked off on November the first in London. A post by the venue, The Underworld, which hosted the show, alleged the band's agent claimed the band had sold 291 tickets in advance, but only three people turned up. Then there's a tweet from The Underworld. What happens to the 291 advance ticket sales your agent said you'd sold? Three people turned up. Please don't lie about ticket sales and please don't contact us again for a show. Good on them. Things didn't go any better from there. The exchange in Bristol realised they'd had a similar hoax pulled on them a few days later with a promoter saying 180 tickets uh, had been sold in advance, only to have no one show up but a few people from the opening band's guest list. The venue did a little digging and discovered Threaten's online numbers had been faked with uh, with all 100 of the people marked as attending, the Facebook uh, event page living in Brazil, according to their profiles, and a number of phony comments on YouTube. That's right. This is the danger of social media. None of this could have happened without social media. I can't help thinking that, you know, it, it, this is this is a first, but it may not be the last. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I could go on. But the, the story continues. It's fucking amazing. There is an update to the story. There have been a number of new developments since, since this initial story was pu- first published, including the revelation that th- um, Threaten created a fake record label, phony press outlets, non-existent awards, and more to promote this band. Two band members quitting mid-tour, live footage, live footage surfacing, and more. And what's more, Jared Threaten has actually had the nerve to go on social media and say, hey, if you, if you came of the shows you're part you're part of the mystery and all the rest of it what size of fucking ego right what size of ego has to be involved in somebody going to taking out doing all of this to fake a band fucking presence i mean it's effectively there is it's it's effectively the same mindset as a burglar right a burglar somebody yeah, is somebody who can't be asked to get a real job or can't get a real job right but what they want is all the things that come with a job like you know money and being able to go out and you know and and, and all the rest of it so what they do is they break into other people's houses or they break into shops or whatever to steal shit to get money because they can't be bothered to get a job they can't be bothered to do the fucking work and here you have the exact same thing this is a band who cannot be bothered to do the to put the hours in or a man jared thetton a man who cannot be bothered to put the hours in a man who cannot be bothered to actually pay his dues write songs you know and do all the hard stuff when you can fake it 
Fake it till you make it. Well, you didn't make it. Nobody fucking turned up. And your name is absolute fucking mud and scum. No one thinks it's funny. No one thinks it's clever. No one thinks there's any kind of fucking genius at work here. It is just... It, all you did was buy a load of... Set up a load of fake websites. Buy a load of fucking likes. But again, should you be able to do that? Should you be able to do that? Surely the questions behind this are the same questions as... Um, uh, fake news and, and all the rest of it on and, and, and Facebook not doing fucking due diligence on shit, right? Isn't this the same thing? For fuck's sake, this should not be able to happen. It really shouldn't. It's a fucking joke, an absolute fucking joke, and and it, it just absolutely boils my piss that something like this can actually fucking happen. It's a fucking disgrace. There's no, there, there is no, you know, ho ho, the joke's on you. There's, there's, there's no irony to this. There is, no, I cannot find a fucking, one single um, positive aspect to this news story. I really fucking can't. So, there you go. That is where I'm ending the podcast. Well, I'm not because I'm now going to drop in um, that piece I told you about Slayer and my feelings after just having. Um, seen him for the last time but this is me winding up the podcast folks as always it is fucking awesome to be in your ears thanks for tuning in as always and um and do remember when you go to a gig shout bollocks yeah shout bollocks shout bollocks shout talking bollocks shout bollocks back let you let let each other know that there are some other bollockers in the house. Just do that for me. That'd be really cool. Um, please, as always, share, tell people about this. The only way it can grow, the only way it can get bigger and get bigger guests and keep going is if you share and tell everybody about it. If you want to sign up at Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Howard H. Smith. Loads of cool shit there every month. All of the stuff that I've been talking about earlier. Don't forget to sign up at YouTube Talking Bollocks where you can listen to Bollocks Radio. Go there now. There's a whole hour of Bollocks Radio for you to listen to, which is just me and music, just playing your shit that I like, that you might like, that you may have never heard, that you may hate. But whatever it is, you know, sign off in the comments on YouTube. Let me know what you think. And um, just trying to bring you as much stuff as possible, people. And wherever you're listening to this, on the way to work, down the mines, in a dungeon, locked away in Guantanamo Bay, um, on the battlefield... Working on a checkout, you could, you're not going to be able to listen to this while you're working on a checkout. But you know, working in stores, you know, in a in a you know, lifting heavy shit, working in an office, working out um, on your bike, on just wherever you are, whatever you're doing, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for your support. Speak to you next month. And now my thoughts on Slayer. Hi guys, um, I'm I'm at home and. Um, it is the Monday after the Slayer show, um, which was on Saturday at Wembley, which was um, awesome. And um, I really wanted to get this down, um, just the way I've been feeling since, what an experience it was. So um, uh, started out, got there, obituary, um, we're pretty much lost in the fog. I'm not a, a particularly big obituary fan. Um, there was a lot of smoke, there was very little chat with the audience. I mean, whatever, it's just, you know, but... It is what it is. Um, Anthrax were superb. Um, opened with Cowboy from the beginning of Cowboys with Hell, Cowboys from Hell, which I thought was awesome. Um, did a, a greatest hit set. Played two covers. I still don't understand that. Played uh, tar, got the time and um, uh, antisocial, which I can really do without <laughs> when they when they did that. Um, uh, uh, but what was really cool was when they were about to go into the like the war dance bit of Indians, um, they stopped the song, uh, said that Charlie wasn't uh, uh, you know impressed, and, he, and Scott Scott got on the mic and said, "Look, you people down the front, keep doing what you're doing, but you people at the sides, you're a fucking embarrassment. You're, you're you know, you're embarrassing yourselves. Get up! This is a metal show." And I just looked around and saw the whole arena just started standing up up in, in the seats. It was it was fucking superb. And they played out Indians and that was that. And then Lamb of God came on. And uh, everybody seemed to have a really good time apart from yours truly. I stuck it out for about three or four songs. I was just... Oh, those vocals, man. It just sounds like a little barking dog. 
you know. It's just just does nothing for me, nothing at all. Um, just as I was walking out, Randy, Randy Bly was saying, um, oh, you know, make some noise for yourselves, this fucking sold out show, and everyone cheered, and he goes, hey, come on, you can do better than that, and I thought, hang on, what, you're, you're now chastising us to make no, more noise for ourselves, we'll make the requisite amount of noise that is required, okay? Um, so I went for a wander during um, uh, Lamb of God, and um, um, uh, bumped into a friend who I'd bumped into before the gig, uh, it was an old um, childhood friend, and um, it was really good to catch up with him. Uh, it was good to see Elmo. Uh, I know he listens, so that was very cool. Um, and he posted um, uh, on Facebook uh, after the gig um, that um, the first time he ever listened to Rain in Blood was with me. So um, I, I'd completely forgotten about that. And that was really cool, a nice bit of um, uh, symmetry to the whole thing. Um, and then it was time for Slayer. Now, I went to see Slayer for the first time in 1987. Um, I think I've seen him 13, it may be 15 times in total, but it's roughly once every two years since 1987. Um, I have seen them in all guises, all lineups, on all tours. Um, I've seen them with Sepultor and System of a Down, co-headlining, um, you name it. Unfortunately, I missed the Slipknot and Slayer shows because uh, I was in a plaster cast. I had to give him a ticket away. But I went with my friend who I've been to see Slayer with just about every time that I've, been, I've, that I've seen them, apart from when I lived in Newcastle. And, um, but I've been down London here 25 years. That's 25 years going to see Slayer together. And during that show, we just sang every word and jumped to, uh, and, and we're just, we were 17 again. The show was fucking awesome from beginning to end the uh, just the production was superb i've never seen slayer have such a slick big production R- um, and and it was sold out and that is how you do it the sound was spot on the performances were superb gary holt on the money kerry king no perfect solos as always um and you know just awesome rhythm performance tom Araya was enjoying himself he really was. He thanked the audience quite a few times. He said, I'm going to be saying this a lot tonight. Uh, he'd like to have talked more, but you're up against a curfew. Um, and uh, and Bostaff just didn't put a hand or foot wrong. He was absolutely fucking superb. What a set list. A song from every single release, apart from Diabolus and Musica. Um, and, uh, and before you lot start slagging Diabolus and Musica off, because I like that and I'm not so keen on... Um, um, uh, divine intervention, as I've mentioned before. Let's just remember that Diablos Mu- in Musica, of the 13 songs, Jeff Hanneman gets a, cr- a, a writing credit on 11 of them. It's very much a Hanneman album, so before you start going on about, oh, they haven't been any good since Hanneman, and Hanneman did all the best stuff. Yeah, well, Diablos in Musica was pretty much him. So anyway, I digress. Um, fucking awesome. I mean, they played Black Magic, which was a highlight for me. It's the first Slayer song I ever heard. That's kind of like the song that got me into him, that riff. It was just fucking amazing. Um, and it, it it was just incredible, but it really was. It was an emotional experience. It was... It was the end of an era. It was, and I was thinking, like me, me and my friend Anthony, we did. We, we we've been going to Slayer, standing there, losing our shit, singing away to every word all these years, and we're never going to get a chance to do it again. Um, and I was counting down the songs towards the end, and uh, and I, it was just painful. I was really, really dreading the end. Um, I mean, I was in the moment and I was enjoying it, but there as the set wore on it was just kind of like that's the last time I'm song I'm going to hear that live that's the last time I'm going to hear that live that's the last time I'm going to and it was just it really really brought it home it really brought it home I mean I got into Slayer when I was 16 15 I, I'm not sure my yeah might be 15 um Hello 8 was the album at the time and I went back to Show No Mercy but it was like so it was, you know Black Black Magic was the first song I heard um and, you know, Rain in Blood is probably my all-time number one favourite album, um, with Master of Puppets number two, um, and Marillion Script for a Jester's Tear number three. Um, and, I mean, you know, you used to be able to put that album on a C60, you know, a full album, both sides, onto either side of the cassette, and 
just the impact Slayer have had on me and my life and what I ended up doing and where I am now. You know, Slayer plays a role in it. And it was just, it really was the end of an era. And it was in, it was incredibly sad, incredibly moving. Uh, at the end, Tom Araya just didn't seem to want to leave the stage. None of them seemed to want to leave the stage, but Tom most of all. And he, he, he just went to the mic after about five minutes and he just he just said, I'm going to miss you guys. And his voice just cracked with emotion as he said, guys. And it was just, yeah. And then he just looked at the crowd and he just said, Godspeed, and, and walked away. Um, and that's the last time I think I'll ever see Tom or I alive. Um, and it's, it's just weird, you know. It's, it, losing Hanneman affected... Was and I know you people know who are listening to this, who were of a certain age. I know what you mean. It f- just came out of the blue, and it really wiped me out. I, it was just, you know, a real kind of fucking a real shock, a real a real realization of mortality, of your, of your idols, of your of, you know of, of people that you've been fans of forever. And there's something about being in a band that that makes people kind of eternally young as well. You, you kind of think they're always going to be there. And even coming away from the, the Slayer show, I was, it, in my mind, it was like, oh, you know, you'll catch him again next time. I was literally arguing with myself, like, no, there's not going to be a next time. And there's this little voice going, no, there's got to be a next time. There's always a next time. But, you know, reality is there there isn't. Um and as I came out of the, the venue, as people poured into the streets, there was people, loads of people were just going, Slay out! Slay out! Slay And normally, Christ, I find that really annoying. And I just turned to I just turned to my friend and I just looked at him and he looked at me and I just went, It's justified. And he just he just kind of nodded at me because it winds us both up. And there was just, everybody was just shouting Slayer outside the gig as everybody kind of walked away to car parks and tubes. People were still shouting, shouting Slayer. One guy shouted Megadeth, which was which was really funny. Um, it was so inappropriate. It was, um, it was funny, but leaving was like a fucking mass funeral. I mean, yeah, people were shouting Slayer, but it was kind of like, this is the last chance we're going to get to do this. And it was almost a kind of look on shock on people's faces. It was it was that feeling of, wow, that was fucking awesome. That was fucking amazing. That was absolutely brilliant. And right on the heels of that was, never again. That's it. That's the last time you're going to you're going to walk away. You're going to feel that. That unique feeling that only Slayer can deliver. And my friend said, you know, look, for me, that's it. Thrash metal's done. Slayer are thrash metal. Slayer, more than any other band, Slayer are thrash metal. They define it. They had more to do with the, the, the with its expansion than anyone else because they are thrash metal. Metallic very quickly sort of headed off towards the mainstream. But Slayer have always been Slayer. They've always been unashamedly thrash metal. And they've always delivered, always delivered. Kerry King once said in an interview, and he said, I don't think anyone ever comes away from a Slayer show and goes, hmm, yeah, I don't, I don't think they were quite on it tonight. He goes, you know, we leave it all on stage. He did, Gary did, Bostaff did, Tom did, and it was absolutely just, yeah, it was an experience. It wasn't a gig, it was an experience. And, and also, Slayer were just so much head and shoulders above everybody else on the bill. I mean, I thought Anthrax were good. You know, my, my mate was raving about Lamb of God, but all of it just disintegrated under the weight of the Mighty Slayer. Simple as that. There was only one thing you were talking about when you left that gig. There was only one band's performance that stuck in your mind that was worth talking about, and it was Slayer, and that was it. And and anyone, anyone listening to this who was, oh, well, you know, no Hanneman, no Lombardo, I'm not interested, whatever. You missed out. Simple as that. You missed out. Because I've seen all the lineups, as I said, seen everybody, I've seen, you know, seen them do Rain and Blood from beginning to end, twice, with Lombardo, all the rest of it. They have never, ever been better than they were on Saturday night. They've been as good 
a hell of a few to, but that was maximum Slayer. And bearing in mind, yes, I'm more than happy to concede it's like it's only half Slayer, if you like. Although Bostaff is is a worthy member, he's done enough. And Gary Holt, really, we questioning that? That was up there with the best that I have seen them. It was just fucking awesome, slick, powerful, heavy, fast, um, just absolutely precisely and beautifully executed as always and never gonna never gonna get that again never gonna be able to experience that again and um it's two days since the gig and I am still carrying that feeling around with me I'm kind of feeling I mean yesterday which was the morning after the gig I was just fucking sat with the YouTube app on my TV watching as many different clips from different angles of as many different songs from from the previous night as possible um and and check it out it it is it it is just awesome stuff um and i really am still struggling to take on board that i'm never going to get the chance to do that again it really i really do feel like uh, an incredible sense of loss like it, you know, yes, yeah, the end of an era, but it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's an end. It's an end of my era. It's an end of something that I've always known. It's always been there. Slayer, Slayer are touring. Get the tickets. End the conversation. Slayer are playing. Get the tickets. Get the tickets. Just fucking get the tickets. Slayer are coming to town. Um, and that's the way it's always been. And there's just something that I'm having difficulty dealing with and the fact that that's not going to happen again going to really really miss them such a shame but going out on a high and boy did they go out in style that is the way to do it I mean fuck me that is the way to do it with a quite simply 10 out of 10 faultless performance it was fucking awesome